Hello everybody. I welcome you all the attendees to the tutorial on model based development using Simulink on Raspberry Pi. As a part of third EAI International Conference on Security and Privacy in New Computing Environment. So the content of my talk goes like this. Starts with the rapid prototyping, then model based design, its framework, advantages, and how beneficial is to academics and industry. Then the V model approach as a part of MBD by industry with all the four components in it and the conclusions. Start with what is a rapid prototyping? It's a process of quickly creating prototypes to evaluate the design and its functionality. That is at the preliminary version. It is fast, cost effective way for engineers to control signal processing applications, verification of the designs at early stage, and also to evaluate the design trade-offs. As we know that today's market demands devices and systems that are going to be compact, customizable, durable, and also easily maintainable, which in turn requires the complex controllers, processors, or microchips inside these systems. To address these issues, to have a product with all these features in place, we use what is known as an MBD approach as a framework in virtual prototyping of the embedded systems. This MBD has evolved to overcome various difficulties and complexities that typically arise during the design life cycle of a embedded software for all the closed loop systems. This type of software needs to be designed in an iterative manner with extensive involvement of multidisciplinary teams. In most of the practical scenarios, need for embedded software design has to start early before physical prototyping and systems are made available for that. Using this traditional approach, the discovery of design and requirement analysis are found later in the design cycle, which leads to an expensive delays. So to overcome this, the MBD frameworks works out here, which in turn will identify the errors in the early design phase while significantly minimizing the rework which is required in the later phases of the design cycle or a product cycle. Embedded software designs such as those extensively used in avionics, automotive systems are so complex to develop. So they require lots of coordination among the various modules uh, and then integration. So wherein this model based approach is then opt for uh, deploying this in the into such type of an embedded industries. Basically a complex system when we say we really um, make the model using mathematical and visual methods. And MBD, as I said, it will address all the early design errors. And most importantly, it performs verification and validation through testing in the simulation environment before we go on to the physical uh, target or the physical environment. So in this context, MBD when effectively used is able to provide a single design environment so that the developers can use for their entire life cycle for data analysis, model visualization, testing and validation, and ultimately product deployment 
with or without the code generation. So this is in totality our MBD, which has model, simulation, verification of the control algorithm we develop, in turn generates, auto generates the code, C, C++ or HDL, and deploying onto the embedded hardware as well as testing. So the entire approach has all these phases in it and each phase in every at the end of each phase there is going to be a verification and validation. So the overall our MBD framework includes modeling, simulation, rapid prototyping, embedded deployment in the application, in loop testing as well as integration of all the subsystems leading to an integral activities. And MBD makes use of models and modeling environment as the basis of the development process. Model is a dynamic system whose response at any time is a mathematical function which in turn is based on the input, its current state and the current time also. So that's how every model for a given intent for a given task we develop and we try to uh, from the model we try to build a system. So this model based design provides an efficient approach for establishing a common framework for communication throughout the design process because there are different models in that every model has to integrate it has to communicate it has to collaborate so this approach is uh, quite uh, good or it is quite efficient in making this task possible which is again a an industry specific approach so the specific approach that's the we design we call it as a this approach that is the approach what is being used for the design phase in an industry we call it as a v design which in turn is in integrated with the mbd approach we we'll look into the v design in the next slide and M mbd in the largest space it uh, is found it it, fo it founds its application in almost all the uh, industries making use of the controls, industrial equipment, aerospace, automotive companies and related applications. Looking at some of the advantages, very easy to maintain and document compared to the legacy code and algorithms. Feature additions are possible and because of the removing the errors and having a verification and validation at the early design phase. So the product lifetime cycle is reduced. And since you don't need to know our programming language over here, so it is going to generate a code automatically. So and even the hardware can also be upgraded into this. So from the models, so the Opto models gives us a high product quality and between the models it's possible to have a good cooperation, communication and collaboration. And we know that now why exactly this is required is our market demands the highly customizable, lifelong, maintainable, recyclable embedded products which in turn will not follow a traditional process models. So therefore, for embedded control and algorithm designers focus on modeling, which has been an essential part of any design process, where this MBD is a prominent feature or a change in the paradigm of embedded system development. And looking at this MBD design, how well it is going to help our academics. So the approach if we follow, so how exactly it will help. So what is through this approach, what is the competency our students are going to get gained? 
so both in terms of technical as well as professionals so why is because if you look at the uh, development activities in majority of the embedded industries 70% of them use an mbd approach specifically in automotive industries namely bosch kpit conti and delphi so they intensively work on this mbd concepts and there's a huge demand or a requirement for these professionals so if we can have this mbd approach as uh, the part of our curriculum as a part of our practice in the academics in designing any embedded system software and our hardware uh, it's possible that it's, we can make our students industry ready, ready so that they can be directly put on to the jobs by most of the industries so which in turn that is basically a means uh, for uh, students to gain competency with respect to technical as well as professional and on the other hand how this model based design helps the industries basically in faster prototyping of the products which is the real you can say an uh, ultimate task for an industry testing and debugging and making changes to the algorithm as uh, the mbd uh, focus more on the algorithm development and wherein it can be really um, upgraded with the previous version no programming need to be learned over here because it auto generates the code what you want with the concept in place that is a model in place and porting onto a different hardware because uh, the mbd approach or the mbd platform uh, is flexible to the various hardwares and mbd also supports the low cost hardware it improves the quality of the product and also can we can bring in the functions with the high complexity so these are some of the advantages what a industry is going to get using this mbd looking at this model for an mbd that is a v model what is this v model so industry has adopted this v model development process where this v represents the sequence of steps in the project life cycle development which exhibits the interactions between each stage of the development life cycle and its related testing phases that is every development stage say for example a mil model in loop has its testing phase that is integration validation and verification so that is the module development or the subsystem development is every development is associated with the testing and verification this v cycle software development has a new paradigm that is nothing but our mbd which is introduced here to test the product beforehand unlike the earlier process or the traditional process wherein the entire code is going to be generated and then it is going to be deployed and also now here model is generated tested and then we generate a code out of it here this process or this approach in turn gives an opportunity to test the overall functionality and also to correct and recheck at every stage any flaws associated with that much before we generate a code and then we deploy it onto the target so hence reduces the development time largely actually the process starts from the specification or from the system level specification or the product level requirements to a uh, high level that is we come out with an architecture of the system and which in turn is going to be decomposed in terms of the subsystems and the integration between them making an overall system so hence we can say that it has a system level specification to high level design then to a low level de design that is overall i can say that from requirement analysis system level design sub system level design then sub system level implementation 
followed by integration and test of subsystem and system integration and testing to complete the entire system in place or a product in place and this v model can be interpreted as a reference model that is used to propose an iterative process in designing for ensuring uh, our product quality or the characteristics got this it's a multi domain the from the requirements we have a different models and each model when implemented using a mathematical and visual representation is again going to be validated and verified then comes our uh, software in loop wherein how we generate a code out of it then processor in loop we put it onto a processor and again validate it then finally onto the hardware that is the plant where we really want to put it and again have an integration and again have a validation and verification through integration process to make it a, a product so in, in the various stages of development modeling more module and model analysis covers system design to specific discipline specific designs also making possible a complete system integration and if you look at all these four uh, components or the modules in a thing so irrespective of the domain the usage of mbd is gaining rapidly across all the fields so one of the example we can say here is to how exactly i need to design a model so one of the example here the model which i told you it's a mathematical and visual representation so a task is given let us say that there is some uh, motor uh, which we are trying to model it mathematical equivalent of that maybe the input to my uh, system can be this is i am representing with the help of a simulink in a matlab so modeling methods are different domains i can have it as a data flow that is uh, the block diagram representation can go for a physical modeling that is the schematic maybe textual that is programming or through uh, my state machine so these are the different ways i can represent a model so then this model is going to be your simulink model so this is going to be a part of my task or an intent where i want to which i want to put it onto the target so here from this uh, simulink model so the one which we have generated we generate a code that is in a software in loop the code is generated and tested on a the desktop which we are using so with the uh, compiled uh, code with the functional wrapper it is going to be provided and again there is going to be a we perform a validation and verification for this then fine then the one whatever we did that is a software the module that is a code what we generated we put it onto one embedded target that is a processor and again the processor is being tested for this code which we have deployed onto this then finally in the hardware in loop that is my last module again uh, the embedded target wherever we have put our code that is the model has been converted into code then code has been put on to the processor and that is, as an embedded is going to get interface to my um, plant plant in place whichever the plant we have want to control or uh, do any changes into that so my entire uh, the task is going to be on my board and that is going to be put on to this that is a hardware in loop and tested for the plant performance so the here the board which we are using is a no uh, is a raspberry pi or anything whereas my plant i have taken here as a speed code which is again going to be on one of the embed boards only so my entire controller and an engine whichever it is it's a part of my 
the MBD design and that I am going to control it to this. That is a basically it's a design of one of the controller which has been shown here as an example to uh, and make you all understand the different phases in a MBD and, and each phase how it is being associated with the testing which is shown on the right hand side. So every phase is going to be integrated with the verification and validation so as to reduce the uh, product life cycle time or it is a which leads to a lesser time for uh, coming out with the product. So this is what is our verification and validation at every stage I explain. So with this MBD, uh, the approach, irrespective of any domain, you can say that this has gained its uh, popularity. So why basically? So I explained uh, why exactly it is for uh, uh, how the modules are developed and how each module is being ported onto the target through a different uh, stages that is through a software in loop and a processor in loop and then comes to the hardware in loop it is. So reduces the uh, product life cycle type and is uh, opted. It is being opted uh, by every embedded system software or a hardware designer. So to summarize, I can say that this has provided simplified approach for various complex and dynamic control systems and has a very uh, quantitative and qualitative benefits over antiquated design processes which are in place. Simplifies the entire process by auto generating codes and reusage of models is one of the advantages for of an MBD approach and majority all the automotive and aeronautical industries are rapidly adopting to MBD approaches only and has been recommended even for embedded hardware design companies as well as software and MBD has become a part of part and parcel of any design process as such. So with this introduction to an MBD, we will move on to an example uh, of how I can with this one some of the case studies, how I can build my model and every stage how it is possible for us to validate and verify and then finally build the model intended, finally build the system intended. So this can be explained with the help of some case studies and making an IoT device making that to work through an IoT protocol. So this is going to be explained by our colleague. Thank you. Thank you very much for patience here. So let, let us see what are the phases of model based design technique. So there are four different phases what I see. That is MIL, that is model in loop. You have SIL, software in loop. PIL processor in loop and then you have HIL hardware in loop. Let us see what are these. What is MIL? So MIL stands for model in loop. I will take a case study and some examples. I will explain you what is this model in loop. So model in loop here I have a plant model that is engine and I have a controller ECU. Okay. So I am going to model this engine behavior in the simulink or any other simulation software. At the same time, I am going to model the controller behavior. Okay. So in the software, simulation software, I am going to model this and put them together. So this becomes my model in loop. I test it and validate it. Okay. So this is what is model in loop. So I have a plant model as well as a controller model. I put them in a loop that becomes my model in loop. Okay, then we have software in loop. Okay, here I have a plant model again and I have a controller mode. I have a controller. So the engine is my plant model. So I'm going to mo uh, model that in the simulation software. 
okay so that is my model and then I also model the controller in the Simulink or any other simulation software and then I generate a C file out of it and then I put them together in a loop that becomes my software in loop here the engine is modeled in a simulation software and I get the model so all the engine behavior is modeled and then I model the controller okay and then generate a C file out of it and put that C file in loop with the uh, engine model so this becomes my software in loop so now I have the next is processor in loop so I'm going to model the engine in the simulation software and then I will also model the controller okay again in the simulation software so I have engine model okay and I have a C file and I generate a hex file out of it uh, or a binary file out of it and dump it to the target hardware so here the engine model will be running in the desktop machine or the host machine whereas the the binary file will be running on the actual hardware and I put them together in a loop where you can send the data to the target hardware and then you can also receive a feedback from the hardware so this loop we call it as a processor in loop here we are going to have a actual hardware here but the plant model is running in the host so this is what is processor in loop so next up we have HIL hardware in the loop okay so here I have a prototype of the plant model it may be actual plant model or it could be a prototype of a plant model okay but here I have a controller so I model the controller behavior in the simulation software and then I generate a C file out of it and then I convert it to the binary file okay and dump it to the target hardware so the the, uh, the, the hex file or the bin file will be running on the real hardware a controller uh, model okay so the controller will be running in the the target hardware okay so this is the engine it could be a prototype of an engine or it could be a real engine I connect them together in a loop that becomes my HIL hardware in the loop so MIL SIL PIL HIL are widely used in automotive industry so these are a very very important questions in the interview in the previous video you have seen what is model based design what are the phases of model based design techniques like MIL SIL PIL and HIL and its application in the field of embedded system and automotives there are various advantages of using uh, different phases of model based design technique in this video I am going to show you how to set up a MATLAB and Simulink support package for Raspberry Pi so whatever algorithm we want or whatever application we want we are going to design those applications or algorithms in the Simulink model based design so once our model is ready so we have to deploy that model on the Raspberry Pi so that means first thing is we need to model the, the algorithm in the Simulink so Simulink supports a lot of hardwares like Raspberry Pi, Arduino, BeagleBone Black so there are n number of hardwares it supports so by default in the Simulink library there won't be a Simulink support package for Raspberry Pi so this is an additional package that you need to install so I'm going to show you how to install that support package so by installing that support package so you will be able to model your algorithm in Simulink and deploy it to the Raspberry Pi hardware okay so this is for the version uh, I will show you so my version uh, MATLAB version is 2018A okay so uh, for uh, the higher version it could be a little different but more or less it will be the same okay so here I am going to show you the steps on how to install Simulink support package for Raspberry Pi okay 
so go to add-ons in the matlab go to add-ons click on get hardware support package okay uh, uh, very important thing so uh, so if you want to go to the hardware support package you need to be connected to the internet if you are not connected to the internet so you will not be able to go to the uh, the hardware support package uh, page okay so make sure that you are connected to the internet so once you click on to the hardware support package so it will take you to the new window uh, just a second it's opening up okay so the new window has opened up just search for the raspberry pi support package okay here you can see there are uh, so many different uh, support packages that uh, simulink supports like here you have arduino support package which i have already installed okay raspberry pi support package so this is the matlab support package for raspberry pi similarly you have one more that is simulink support package for raspberry pi hardware so here i have already installed so that is the reason it is displayed as installed so if in your case if it is not installed it will be something like this okay so click on this icon okay so here i have already uh, have the uh, uh, simulink support package of raspberry pi so it is uh, uh, displayed as manage so in your case it will be like uh, there will be icon called install okay i will show you for other uh, any other not installed uh, uh, tool okay let's say for example uh, matlab support package for arduino hardware so i will click on this and i'm just for example i'm showing how uh, it will look if it is not installed so look at this so here you are uh, seeing right so it is saying install so you click on install and follow the steps so it will uh, it will ask you to download it you have to download it okay when you click on install i will install it uh, for the arduino okay maybe you can follow the same same step for raspberry pi okay so you need to have a, a mathworks login id and password okay if you don't have login uh, account you need to create one login in mathworks okay you should have a login otherwise you will not be able to install this so just login with your login id and password okay so another window will pop up and it will display like uh, what are the things uh, which is going to be installed so please follow the steps accordingly okay once it is installed go back to the the simulink window okay so you click on the uh, simulink library browser okay so in the simulink library browser you can see now the simulink support package for raspberry pi is installed already okay so once you follow those steps this uh, library packages will be available now for you to use okay so this is how you have to install simulink support package for raspberry pi hardware so in the next video you we will see okay in the next video we will see how to install raspbian os onto the sd card welcome back in the previous video we have seen how to install simulink support package for the raspberry pi board okay so in this video we will see how to install raspbian os onto the raspberry pi board so you don't need to you don't need to install raspbian os separately so there is a facility provided within the matlab tool wherein you can directly uh, the install the os onto the sd card okay so here are the steps on how to install the raspbian os onto the raspberry pi board so you need to install this raspbian uh, raspberry uh, raspbian os onto the sd card and then you have to connect that to the raspberry pi board so here are the steps how to install the raspbian os so go to matlab and type target updater okay press enter so another window will pop up okay so here you have to uh, select which board you are using 
whether it is a Arduino because here we have installed support package for Raspberry Pi, Arduino and Android. So whatever hardware support packages we have installed that will appear over here. So you have to click on this drop down menu. So choose Raspberry Pi board and go to next. So there are several Raspberry Pi boards are available. Okay, like Raspberry Pi 2, Raspberry Pi 3, Raspberry Pi 4. So different versions are available. So you have to choose which, uh, which board you are using. In our case, we are having Raspberry Pi 3 model B. So these are the different models which uh, the uh, MATLAB 2018 supports. So you can choose whichever Raspberry Pi board you have. So I have Raspberry Pi 3 model B. Okay, and then click on next. Okay, so here you have to select whether to set up a hardware with the MathWorks Aspen image or customize the existing operating system running on your hardware. Okay, so the MATLAB and Simulink support package for Raspberry Pi requires a customized version of the Aspen OS. Okay, so it is based on the Linux operating system. So you choose a setup hardware with the MathWorks Raspbian image or you can also choose customize but in our example we are going to show you how to use this how to set up the hardware with the, the MathWorks Raspbian image okay and some points you have to note down here so you must have the Ras Raspberry Pi board you should have SD card with a minimum of 4 GB 5 volt micro USB power supply to connect the or power up the Raspberry Pi board then you need to have an Ethernet cable in case you do, if you if your board doesn't have a, a Wi-Fi module okay so either way is fine either you can have a, a Ethernet cable or you can have a Wi-Fi module onto the Raspberry Pi board because several uh, Raspberry Pi board doesn't have inbuilt Wi-Fi module so the only option left out is the Ethernet cable okay then click on next So you need to download this file here okay if you don't have already then you have to download okay once you download then go to the next okay browse that download downloaded folder okay and then you can say uh, after downloading choose that particular file okay and validate that particular file so here is the file which i have raspbian okay so i want to choose this file so already i have downloaded it so i, I don't have to download so i will browse this file from here and I will just uh, so once you browse that file click on validate so now it is a valid Raspbian image so then you can click on next So there are uh, multiple options provided in the way you connect the uh, Raspberry Pi board to the your computer or your desktop. Okay, so you can connect your Raspberry Pi board onto the LAN network directly and access the Raspberry Pi board, or you can connect over the Wi-Fi module. If your um, Raspberry Pi board has a Wi-Fi module, then you can connect over the Wi-Fi module. You can directly connect to the host computer or you can manually enter the network settings so what i do is i will directly connect my raspberry pi board to the desktop machine or a laptop so choose this option then click on next uh, now you have to connect your sd card to the laptop or uh, desktop and just click on refresh 
okay so once you click on refresh you must see the sd card drive over here then after that click on next so once you click on next okay so you will find the uh, okay so like like this you will get the drive okay so the drive should be detected if it is not detected you will not be able to uh, dump the uh, raspbian os onto the sd card so you must be detected something like this okay after that you have to just click on write so once you click on write the uh, raspbian os will be downloaded to the sd card okay welcome to this presentation on how to run simulink model on raspberry pi to run a simulink model on raspberry pi these are the two major steps that you need to follow first thing is install simulink support package for raspberry pi by default simulink support package for raspberry pi won't be available in the simulink tool set so you need to separately install and also you have to install raspbian os onto the sd card so i have created a separate videos on how to install simulink support package for raspberry pi and how to install raspbian os onto the sd card okay now i'm going to teach you how to deploy this uh, simulink model once you are ready with these two things the next step is you have to build a simulink model and deploy it to the raspberry pi so i'm going to show you how to build a simulink model and deploy it to the raspberry pi so go to simulink uh, library browser window so once you install simulink support package after that you can see there are uh, uh, additional support packages packages are added to the simulink uh, library browser so by default these support packages won't be available so you have to install this uh, support packages additionally so click on this simulink support package for raspberry pi hardware you can see the uh, simulink uh, blocks for raspberry pis are there so there are a number of blocks so we are going to start with a simple uh, example wherein we are going to turn on the onboard led so right click on this board and add to new model okay so if i if i want to uh, turn on the led i have to send a, a signal okay after you add this block go to the commonly used block pick up this constant block so i want to send a high signal to the led block right click and add it to new model and then uh, so those blocks are added already into the model so connect this block so now you can see that uh, uh, this constant block is connected to the LED block. So the output type of this constant block is double but whereas uh, LED blocks can accept only a boolean. So if you run this model you might get an error. Okay. So to avoid that error double click on this constant block and change the output type to boolean. Okay. So now uh, your model is ready. Okay, so and also you need to configure some pa configuration parameters uh, you have to do that is double click on this uh, Raspberry Pi LED block. Okay, so which board there are several boards that Simulink supports. So whichever board you are using, you have to configure for that. So here we are using, for example, Raspberry Pi 3 model B. So you can also click on this uh, view LED location where exactly this LED is located on the Raspberry Pi board. Okay, you can see this is the LED which we are trying to control or light up. Okay, now once it is done, to deploy this uh, model onto the Raspberry Pi, uh, some of configuration parameters have to be. Okay, once your model is ready to deploy onto the Raspberry Pi, before you do that step, a uh, few more configuration parameters that you need to set. So to do that, go to tools. Click on run on target hardware. Prepare to run. After that configuration parameter window will pop up. Choose the hardware board that we are using. Here we are using Raspberry Pi. Choose Raspberry Pi. And then click on OK. Okay. 
okay now your model is ready to be deployed onto the raspberry pi so to deploy this model onto the raspberry pi go to this icon and click on deploy to hardware once it starts deploying to the raspberry pi board on the corner you can see uh, right now it is saying as ready once it start building it will show it as building and once it's deployed it will show it as ready thank you so much to okay to run the model in the external mode go to simulink model here you can see by default this will be uh, in the normal mode okay to run the simulink model in the external mode where the model will be running on the raspberry pi but it will be interacting with the simulink okay change this normal mode to external mode okay and also you can specify for how long the model should run on the raspberry pi so the advantage of the external mode over the normal mode is that okay so when normally you deploy the model from by uh, clicking on this icon the model will deploy it on the raspberry pi and it will work as a standalone okay whereas whereas in the external mode when you click on this external board okay and click on this button then the whole model will be running on the raspberry pi but it can still communicate with the simulink so for example if a raspberry pi is picking some sensor data it can give it to the simulink and you can write an algorithm to process that data that is the advantage of the external mode so to run it in external mode click on this run button welcome to this video on how to find the ip address of raspberry pi without connecting a keyboard and monitor often it is required to find the ip address of the raspberry pi board and we struggle a lot to find out its ip address and we use a lot many tools uh, to scan the ip but there is a very simple way to find the ip address without even connecting the keyboard and monitor Okay, these are the steps. Just uh, plug in the headphone into the audio socket of the Raspberry Pi. Power up the Raspberry Pi board. Wait until it boots up and listen to the IP address that Raspberry Pi reads out. It's something like it will read out my IP address is 169.254.0.2. So this is for example. So this is the easiest way to find out the IP address of the Raspberry Pi. Thank you very much. Are you unable to deploy Simulink model onto the Raspberry Pi hardware? There could be several reasons why your model wouldn't have deployed onto the Raspberry Pi. Here's a small presentation on how to resolve this issue and troubleshoot connecting to Raspberry Pi hardware and deploy the Simulink model onto the Raspberry. The possible reasons why your model wouldn't have deployed. It could be because of the mismatch in the IP address. Please cross verify before you deploy a Simulink model onto the Raspberry Pi. There could be a mismatch in the IP address. The current IP address of the Raspberry Pi and the IP address set in the Simulink model. To check that, go to the Simulink model. Go to the Simulink model. Okay, go to Tools. Run on Target Hardware. Options. So here configuration parameter window will pop up and uh, under the target hardware resources and board parameters you can see device address is here set as 169.254.0.2 So you have to cross verify this IP address with the current IP address of the Raspberry Pi If there is a mismatch then you will get SSH error Okay, and also one more important thing you have to look at is the login ID and password These two are case sensitive okay by default the username and uh, passwords are set as pi and raspberry respectively okay please cross verify this as well okay if you set any uh, password as in capitals then it might not work okay so the username and password are case sensitive so please cross verify that also so if you, these things are correct your model might uh, get dumped to raspberry pi Okay. okay another reason yes i just mentioned invalid login id and password so by default the raspberry pi login id is pi and password is raspberry please cross verify and they are case sensitive another possible reason could be 
because of the ethernet communication if the ethernet cable leds are not on for sure you will not be able to deploy simulink model onto the raspberry pi the leds are not on because of various reasons if the ethernet cable has got some problem then the leds will not be on or if the ethernet port itself has got some problem in the laptop or it could be at the desktop then you will not be able to see this leds on if the leds are not on model cannot be deployed onto the raspberry pi or if there is any problem with the sd card if the sd card is damaged then it will not be able to you know boot up if it, if it is not able to boot up then the leds will not be on then model cannot be deployed or it could be because of uh, os crash if the raspberry os is crashed then you will not be able to deploy the model okay one of the one solution you can try is uh, try to reinstall the raspberry os okay or if there is any problem with the ethernet port then you have to rectify that first okay another possible reason if there are more number of devices connected to the raspberry pi okay and if you have powered up raspberry pi using a usb cable without using any external power adapter okay then it will eat out uh, more current and your pi cannot function properly so to rectify that what i suggest to you is use an external power adapter then if the wrong working directory is set then you will not be able to build a model itself if the model is not built then you will not be able to deploy okay to rectify this you change the directory to some working directory okay another major reason okay yeah, uh, Raspberry Pi running the old model. It seems that when you deploy Simulink model onto the Raspberry Pi, okay, it seems that the model uh, has deployed, and you might get the report also. But still, the Raspberry Pi will be running the old model. Okay, there are uh, several solutions to overcome this problem. The solution number one is save the model before deploying. For example, when you are working, so you might be editing uh, the Simulink model, but without saving, if you deploy the Simulink model, the Raspberry Pi will be running the older model itself. Okay, so for that reason, before you deploy any Simulink model, save that model and then try deploying. Okay, and if still this doesn't work. Okay, what you can do is you close the MATLAB completely. Okay, and relaunch the Simulink model again. Okay, after opening the Simulink model, again try to deploy. So this could be one of the solution to overcome this problem. Okay, if the Raspberry Pi is running the older model, so what you can do is save the model, close it completely, again relaunch the Simulink model. And deploy it again. Okay, this might solve the problem. Solution number two. Okay, even if you try solution number one, or if it still doesn't work, what you can do is you can run the model in the external mode. Solution number two is run the model in the external mode. Okay, if the model runs successfully in the external mode. Okay, solution number two is run the model in the external mode. Okay, you have to run this. You have to run the simulating model in the external mode. If it successfully runs in the external mode, then try the normal mode. Okay, normally how you deploy to the hardware, you can try that. Okay, if it successfully runs in the external mode, then it might work again. Okay, this is solution number two. You can watch this. Okay, solution number three. If the problem still persists, okay, even if you run it in external mode, if the, even still uh, it's unable to uh, run the new model, then you can try these below mentioned steps. Okay, you have to delete all the files related to your model on the Raspberry Pi. It is not in the laptop or a desktop. Okay, you have to delete all the files related to your model in the Raspberry Pi board. 
okay not in the in the desktop or laptop okay and run the model in an external mode again okay how to delete all the files related to your model on the raspberry pi so before you delete the files related to your model on the raspberry pi first you should know where exactly these files are stored in the raspberry so to know where exactly they are stored in, in the matlab command window execute the following command type pwd and press enter so pwd is the present working directory so this will show you where exactly the um, simulink uh, models are stored in the raspberry pi so here you can see when you type pwd in the matlab window it will show you the path where exactly these uh, files are stored in the raspberry i am not talking about the files which are stored in the the laptop or a desktop these are the files which are stored in the raspberry pi okay so this is a path where exactly they are stored in the raspberry pi okay once you know where exactly the simulink models are stored then you can delete it easily so you can nav navigate to this path okay and then uh, okay so come back to the matlab window and just type pi equal to raspberry pi so it will get you the handle for the raspberry pi board okay then you can open up a shell so once you open up a shell you can type this command okay so here in the previous uh, slide you can you have seen where exactly your files are stored okay let us take a look at again so here you can see the, the files are stored in uh, c user student desktop a course project so in this folder these uh, simulink models are stored that is dot elf files okay so in the shell window you can just type sudo find slash home dash name star dot elf okay and it will display all the elf files that is simulink models okay which is in the form of elf files okay so there are n number of elf files so here you can also uh, you can find out where exactly your files okay here is a path so you can see home pi matlab underscore ws so this version is 2018 bc so here you can see from c users student desktop a course projects this is our project folder okay so and this is our uh, simulink model gear indicator uh, indicator switch dot elf okay or there are two models here gear underscore indicator dot elf now whichever model you are dump, uh, dumping or uh, deploying you can delete that model or you can delete the whole folder itself okay if you delete whole folder all this elf uh, gear indicator dot elf and get indicator underscore switch elf both will be deleted okay to delete that okay so first you have to uh, navigate after opening up the shell uh, to delete that model navigate to this for path okay just type cd slash matlab underscore w 2018c so navigate to this path so once you navigate to this path you can type rm space gear underscore indicator dot elf so this is my uh, simulink model name okay so if you type this then this file will be deleted okay or if at all if you want to remove whole folder you can just type rm minus rf a e course project the whole folder will be deleted okay after deleting okay again you after executing this rm minus rf a e course project or rm gear underscore indicate dot lf you can run the simulink model in the external mode or you can also deploy it the normal procedure so this would solve your problem thank you so much for watching this video hope uh, this has addressed your issues
Hello, every teacher. Today, I will introduce a physical on-group function uh, based uh, to factor group authentication chain in smart home. Uh, I will introduce the conference paper from background contributions, preliminaries, the detailed group authentication chains, uh, performance analysis, and uh, and uh, and eventually conclude the uh, conclude the paper. Firstly, many authentications uh, uh, many authentication schemes adopt a one to one style in smart home. It is ineffective to authenticate the smart device. Also, many uh, many elect uh, elliptic curve cra uh, cryptography uh, best schemes has been. Uh, pur proposed uh, to enhance the security of the authentication, auth authentication schemes. However, these schemes generally require to perform comp uh, complex uh, computational operations, uh, which are not suitable for the resource constrained device. In addition, many authentication schemes cannot withstand a smart device lost attack. The adversary can often system, uh, system information stored in the smart device. Therefore, we propose a physical on-group function based to fat group authentication chain to hand above the flaws in smart home. Then, I will introduce the uh, contribution in this paper. The first one. A uh, physical group, fun uh, group function based uh, anonymous group uh, authentication chain is present in our paper. Our chain is suitable for the resource constrained smart device, only using lightweight uh, operations and uh, symmetrical crypt cryptography. Furthermore, uh, furthermore, the proposed chain um, can meet many security uh, requirements, such as user and me and military, uh, arm traceability, and uh, we withstand many known attacks. The second one, the physical security of the smart device is guaranteed by the physical on curve function technology. The output of the physical on curve function depends on the physical microstructure of the smart device. A uh, physical uh, on-group function has a capture of the temperature resistant, on chrome ability, and on predictability. The dy uh, dynamic dynamic join or and the living of the smart device from deployed uh, network are both uh, supported by the proposed chain. The illegal smart device fail to obtain the group key without the secret share. The new device, uh, the new smart device, just registered to sell before joining the uh, deployed network. Uh, in this session, I will introduce the mass preliminary of the paper. Chinese reminder theorem is adopted to <coughs> construct the chain. It is assumed that there are n prime positive integers p1 to pn. Let P be the product of the n prime positive, positive integers. This satisfies the condition that, uh, as shown in, in the PPT. Let C I, uh, uh, let C one to C n be n positive uh, integers. The unique generation uh, generate solution of the of these uh, equations. Uh, in, is shown as the as the equation. Uh, uh, chi is computer uh, as computer as it, and it satisfied that chi is equal to number one. We modify uh, we modify model pi. I also. I also. 
induce the smart device protection mechanism. I adopt the physical uncurve function and physics uh, extractor to gener generate the secret uh, key RG, uh, secret key RG to protect the uh, premise stored in the sm uh, smart device. The physical device, uh, the physical uncurve function is based on the physical system. It is defined as a function f. We input challenge c. It outputs the response r. The challenges and their corresponding response are called the challenge response pairs. The physical uncurve functions has many uh, pro uh, properties. The first one, uh, uncurve. For all the inputs, C belong to the challenging state. Uh, there is no function f bond satisfying that we input the same the challenging. It outputs the same response. The second one, uh, unpredictable. Uh, given uh, for all the inputs belong to challenging state, the proper ability of the adverse correctly guessing the response at G or the function f correspond to the changing state G. In probabilistic uh, polynomial time is uh, is uh, nick uh, nick nick The output of the function uh, is a random uh, random uh, strain uniform chosen from the same space. The third one is uh, computable. Uh, it's in fact in Feasible to compute the response correspond uh, to the challenge in probabilistic uh, polynomial time for all the inputs belong to the challenging state. Given the same uh, challenging C, it outputs the same the response within a lot uh, error range. The physics asset generates the secret RG when input the per uh, input the response R. When secret RG, uh, then secret RG is utilized to protect the uh, premise stored in the smart uh, device. There are four types of entities in, in the uh, smart home. Uh, the KGC is uh, a trusted uh, key generation center and uh, is uh, usually ut utilized to dis uh, distribute uh, sensitive uh, premise for the user uh, home gateway smart device security. Uh, the user uh, is the owner of the smart, uh, smart uh, smartphone uh, which has the ability to uh, estimate the user's biometrics and error verify the user's identity. Uh, the user can assess the smart device after registering with the KGC. The home, home gateway is a trusted entity and cannot be com uh, compromised by the adversary. The smart device can uh, execute the commands and uh, uh, collect the information in smart home. Every smart device have a unique identity and cannot be followed by the uh, phys by the adversary uh, physically. Uh, the the um, premise uh, uh, stored in the smart device uh, uh, are uh, protected by the uh, secret uh, key RG Sec uh, by the secret key. Uh, uh, Spider security key RG. Uh, uh, so all the smart device uh, can uh, use uh, utilize uh, the physical uncurve function to withstand the smarter device lost attack. In the uh, uh, registration phase, the KGC establishes the uh, univariate. Uh, polynomial uh, function <coughs> as the equal one. Uh, usually the uh, the secret is uh, uh, the secret is set uh, a, uh, a zero and uh, the secret share for 
uh, it's a smart, uh, for each smart device is uh, generated by the KGC. During the authentication uh, phase, the home gateway can send the request to the to a group of the smart device as uh, equation two and three. Only the illegal smart device with the uh, uh, with the PJ can calculate the uh, parameters RJ and uh, 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 describe uh, the message to obtain the sensitive uh, premise. Then a group of smart devices sent their, uh, their secret share secretly to the home gateway. The home gateway uh, recovers the secret S as the equation for. Finally, the uh, user equipment and the smart device uh, authentication authenticated each other successfully and uh, established uh, the group of secret key uh, GSK based on the secret sharing technology and uh, uh, Chinese reminder uh, system. We evaluate the communication and the computational cost in our authentication shim compared to other shims. The, uh, the proposed shim is uh, simulated using uh, Perry best uh, best uh, cryptography uh, library. The, uh, from the table 2 and the table 3, we can see that the communication and the computational cost of other shims Incre increase as the number of the assisted smart device. Uh, um, our authentication chain can effectively reduce the communication and the computational cost when the user uh, assisted uh, lots of the uh, 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 lots of the smart device at the same time. Uh, in conclusion, uh, in this paper, we propose the uh, physical group function based uh, to factor an uh, nominal group of syndication shim for smart home uh, based on the uh, secret sharing technology and the Chinese reminder uh, Chinese reminder theory. Uh, the proposed chain can withstand the many known attacks, which is a proposed, which is a proto under uh, our real or random model. And uh, other security discussion is also described in the paper. Anyone who is interested with it can read our paper. Also, uh, the physical security of the smart device is uh, guaranteed by the physical uncrop function technology. As the physical comp function uh, is uh, function is depends on the uh, physical microstructure of the smart device, any adversary can focus the uh, for the physical uh, structure of the smart device. So uh, the uh, the the, uh, the uh, secret of the uh, smart device is protected by the uh, uh, physical uh, feasible uncrowed function. Uh, compared to other uh, other related shims, our shims can also uh, effectively reduce the, the resource cost during the loan and uh, uh, authentication phase. Uh, in addition, our smart device protected by the physical comp function uh, uh, secret, uh, uh, secret against the smart device lost attack. So uh, uh, my presentation uh, is over. Uh, thank you. Uh, if, uh, if, some, uh, if, any, uh, if some anyone have questions, they can uh, 
sent me the uh, message uh, sent me message by uh, uh, sent me the message uh, thank you Okay, my name is Lu Yanrong. I come from CAUC, China. My topic is an authentication framework in ICN-enabled industrial cyber-physical systems. My topic includes four parts. The first one is introduction. The second one is Basics of proxy-based authentication approach. I will uh, simply introduce our approach. The third one is our solutions. The last one is our conclusion. Authentication is the first door to gain access to the internet. Because when an entity wants to get service from the internet, it should be authenticated by, the, by an authority server. Authentication in an ICN ICPS is to check users or devices who is requesting and who is replaying once a malicious users malicious user or device is found, the authority server will stop the session immediately. There are two types of countermeasures. The first one is end-to-end -end scheme. It looks like the traditional IP network. When a user wants to get access to the service from the remote server, the user and the server should be connected directly and transmit the packets from each other, between each other. However, the, this approach has a significant overhead and a delay. Another approach is proxy-based proxy scheme. It is the best, it is established um, via annual router. Annual router. The annual means the user's neighborhood and the server's neighborhood will transmit their packets instead of the original user and the original server. Respect, respectively. And obviously, the, this approach is simpler and faster than end-to-end -end scheme. Based on these reviews, let me introduce our approach simply. The figure describes our system model. There are two levels, the upper level is controller, the lower level is physical devices. Devices. The ICN is used to handle packets in this level. There are five entities in our system model. ICN basic routers, carrier, it means controller, consumers, consumers and the providers and also attackers. The content names in our system model follow a hierarchical naming scheme. It's a root tree naming architecture we will introduce later. There are key technologies in our approach. To secure against the provider reputation, the proxy signature is used to is used to check the data packets. 
To secure against the consumer impersonation, the handshake between consumer and the ICPS provider to check the consumer's legitimacy. Based on these key technologies, I will introduce our solutions specifically. In our solutions, there are two technologies, proxy signature and the station-based handshake. Proxy signature, it means data is signed to generate a digest of cryptographic on behalf of the original signer. In our approach, the proxy signature is used to authenticate the claimed ICPS providers to their consumers without revealing their actual identities. The session-based handshake it is a technique aims to ensure that only legitimate users are allowed to retrieve the raw data. In our approach, the session-based session handshake is used to vary the legitimacy of the requesting consumer. Based on those technologies, we will introduce our solutions for procedures of our solutions. There are five steps in our solutions. The first step is a registration between participants and the controller. The second step is performed at the consumer side who initiates an interest packet to, the, to its neighborhood gateway node. When the gateway node receives the interest packet, it will transmit the packet to the intermediate router until reaching the ICPS device. When the ICPS device receives the interest packet, it will delegate its signing right to its proxy. The proxy is the ICPS device neighborhood. The first or the fourth step is performed at the proxy side who generates a signature on the content content and uh, send back the, the signature to the router until reaching the gateway node. When the gateway node receives the data packet, it will initiate a session handshake with the consumer. They will exchange message and to check the consumer's legitimacy. This table describes, describes the message exchange between consumer and the gateway node. There are four messages. The, the message one is sent by the consumer with interest packet. And the second message is sent by the gateway node with data packet. Third, me third message is sent by the consumer with interest packet. And the last message is replied by the, by the uh, data packet. The interest packet includes content name and the data packet will include name content, signature info, and the content itself. In the interest packet, this is the content name. The backslash differs the components. The domain, domain means a specific area that the service coverage covered. The energy describes the main service provided and the access describes the microservice and the query describes the consumer demand. 
each data packet will will carry the signature signature. When the consumer send uh, an uh, uh, interest packet, and the 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 gateway node will reply by a that packet with its signature. The second step is key generation. When an entity submits its security value and its identity to the PKG. The PKG will generate partial private key and the public key for each entity using its own public key and the private key and send them via secure channel to the to the entity. The entity will generate its own public key and the private key using the partial private key and the public key from the PKG. The third step is proxy signature. When a proxy has its own public key PKB and the private key SKB, it will generate a signature on the content M. When a verify, verify, and this means uh, maybe a router or a consumer or anything else will check the signature is correct or not via this equation. If the equation doesn't hold, the verifier will drop the signature. If not, um, the, it will receive the signature. The, the third step is the session handshake. It's, it, this step happens when the gateway node receives the signature from the proxy. It will initiate a session handshake with the consumer. They will exchange messages and finally generate a session key. When the consumer receives the packets from the gateway node, it will check the session key is correct or not. If the session key is correct, it will further check the signature sigma from the proxy. If not, it will, it will stop the, this session. For the security analyze, we can see that to secure against the passive attacker, no linkage about user identity. Because in our approach, the proxy signature is generated by the proxy without revealing the ICPS provider's identity. And the session handshake is run between consumer and the gateway node without revealing the consumer's identity. To secure against the active attacker, attacker interest and the data packets modification can be detected because all of the data packets are generated by the signature. And we can see this, this, this step that the MSC function is also used in our approach to check the integrity and the authenticity of the packets. So any modification by the malicious, malicious attacker will be detected. For the efficiency analyze, we can see that in network catching can be fully leveraged at the edge. In our, in our approach, we can see that the consumer and the ICPS provider will not connect directly. They transmit the interest packets and the data packets via the ICN routers. 
Also, we can see that more beneficial as the, ni- as the, as the number of popular content increases. One of the disadvantages of, in our approach is the cryptographic operations, such as signature and authentication, may involve serious computational cost because more popular content increases, more signature generate. So it is a balance between catching efficiency and the overhead. Finally, we make a conclusion. In this talk, we introduced a delegation-based authentication approach enabling in network catching. We use consumer-driven session handshake at the edge with hidden consumer ID. And we also use proxy signature to sign on the data packets. For the future, we will implement the performance evaluation in a test bed, test bed. And we also consider to improve our security analyze in, for our design, and so on. Thanks for your attention. Hello, everyone. I'm Wen Xiang Song from Hubei University of Technology. It is my pleasure to give a presentation about our work on access control of wireless body area networks here. In this paper, we propose a secure access control scheme for wireless body area networks, which is based on several text policy attribute-based encryption. And a secure two-body protocol is adopted in our scheme to protect data from internal attacks. In addition, our scheme can implement the strategy that physicians at different levels can only access the information at corresponding secure level, which is conducive to improving the efficiency of access. I'm going to introduce our work in three parts. The first part is the background of our research. The second part is the main work of this paper, and the last part is our conclusion. Start with the first part, background. In this part, I will introduce our research purpose and some tools we used. Wireless body area network is a special wireless sensor network, which is mainly formed by various low energy, low cost, heterogeneous tiny sensors one on the body. As As a popular technology, Wireless body area network has been widely used in e-health to monitor the patient's physical health in real time. The sensors such as body temperature, electrocardiograph, and electrocephalograph are used to correct and monitor the patient's various physiological signals. The collected physiological information will be transmitted to the remote healthcare servers or the personal server device via internet. However, there is a privacy issue in wireless body area network, which is the disclosure of physiological information may bring a potential threat to patient's privacy. For this privacy issue, access control technology have been introduced into wireless body area network. There are some existing access control schemes based on key policy attribute-based encryption in which user can't decide access policies. So they are not suitable for data sharing systems, data sharing systems. In order to construct a scheme that users decide access policies. We choose to use the server text policy attribute based encryption, in which the physician can decrypt the, the patient's physiological data when 
his or her attribute satisfy the access structure set by the patient. The cybertext policy attribute-based encryption scheme mainly consists of four algorithms. The first algorithm is set up, which generates public parameter TK and master key MK. The second algorithm is encryption. The input of this algorithm are plain text M, public parameter PK, and access structure T. The output is cyber text CT. The third algorithm is key generation, the inputs of which are attribute set S, master key MK, and public parameter PK. The output is decryption key SK. The last algorithm is decryption. The inputs are several text CT, public parameter PK, and the decryption key SK. And the output is plain text M. The access tree T is used to represent the structure of access control. Tx is a subtree of, of T. A is a set of attributes that satisfies Tx. The table below gives the parameters of the access tree. Txa can be, computed, can be calculated as follow. When x is a long leaf load, Txa return 1 only if number of children nodes returning 1 exceeds the threshold Tx. And when x is a leaf load, Txa return 1 only if the associated attribute lambda x is in the attribute set A. The second part of my presentation is the main work of this paper. In this part, I'll give the system model and specific implementation of our scheme. The system model of our scheme is as the picture shows. There are four entities in our scheme. Key generation center, data server, physiological data owner, and the physicians. The key generation center is the honest but curious institution which publishing, revoking, and updating physicians attribute key. And granting, and granting different access permissions to physicians according to their attributes. Data server is an incomplement Data server is an incompletely trusted institution responsible for providing stored data access to external users. The physiological data owner is responsible for dividing the information into different levels and define access policy. Physicians include a resident physician, physician in charge, associate chief physician, and chief physician. Physicians with different titles can access the corresponding level of physiological information on that server. The scheme is implemented in six phases. System initialization, key generation, data encryption, data re-encryption, data decryption, and attribute update. Our scheme begins with system initialization phase. In this phase, physiological data owner will divide his or her physiological data PF into n parts of different levels and encrypt them with different symmetric keys. Then the symmetric keys will be encrypted with several text policy attribute based encryption and stored in data server 
with several texts of physiological data. Key generation center will generate the system parameters and choose two hash functions H0 and H1. Then key generation center's master key pair will be generated as the equation one shows. And the master key pair of data server will be generated as the equation two shows. On the data server side, it will pick a number gamma and publish another public key. The second phase of the scheme is key generation phase. In this phase, key generation center will first choose a random number RK and a secure two-party protocol will be performed between key generation center and data server to generate a value W for data server. With data with W gained, data server will choose another random number tau and compute a new value x with W, tau, and G, the generator of group G1. Then data server send x to key generation center. After receive value x, key generation center proceeds it with beta, which is in KGC's private key to generate another value y, and y will be returned to data server. Data server will compute value d with random number tau and receive the y. Then key generation center will generate a physician's attribute key skp as the question 3 shows, with another key skdp generated by data server, the whole secret key set of physician is as equation 4 shows. Besides the SKP, data server also outputs another key set in this phase. After key generation phase finish it, the data encryption phase will be performed. In this phase, physiological data owner will define the an access tree T and choose polynomial QX for each node X in tree T. The degree of polynomial QX equals the threshold TX minus 1. For root node R, the constant term of polynomial QR is a random number S chosen by physiological data owner. For other node X, the constant term of polynomial QX is as the equation shows. Then the subtext CT will be constructed as equation 5 shows, and it will be sent to data server. The fourth phase is data reencryption phase, which will be performed by data server. In this phase, data server will first choose k lambda y to encrypt server text ct as equation 6 shows then it will be true then it will choose a random number rho and compute rxk and compute xk with hashi function h1 after that data server will construct the function fyx showed in equation 7 by constructing the set HMY, data server will generate a set of head HM as the equation 8 shows. At the end of this phase, data server will send the set HMY and the re-encrypted re server text to physician. Following with re-encryption phase, the data decryption phase will be performed by physician. Physician will use the attribute group keys k lambda y to update his or her secret key as equation 9 shows. For those, for those of tree t, the decrypt node function is shown in equation 10. Especially for the root load r, the decrypt node function is as equation 11 shows, by which the symmetric key SKI can be recovered 
and physician can decrypt information of level I with symmetry key SKI. The last phase of the scheme is attribute update phase. In this phase, key generation center can improve physician's level by updating attribute set and physician's key. Conclusion is the last part of our presentation. I'll give the proof of security and experimental results in this part. Our scheme mainly achieves three aspects of security. We first consider about internal attacks. The secure two-party protocol ensure key generation center and data server do not know each other's master secrets, which means they cannot generate a physician's secret key independently. Therefore, our scheme can resist internal attacks. Then we consider about external attacks. Data, confi data confidentiality data confidentiality against the outside adversary can also be guaranteed because external users whose attributes not meet the access policy will be not able to decrypt the ciphertext. In addition, our scheme also achieves collusion resistant. Since the value of since the value is randomized from the private key for a particular user, sensitive value cannot be recovered by the attackers of collusion. We compare our scheme with a scheme of key policy attribute-based encryption for access control in wireless body area networks propo proposed by Ten et al. Results shows our scheme can implement hierarchical access and resist internal attacks, while tens can't. On the computational complexity, complexity side, we give our computational costs of encryption and decryption in the table. The experimental result shows our scheme is efficient, for, is efficient for reducing the computational costs of data encryption and decryption. The above is the whole content of my presentation. Thanks for listening. This is a talk about authentication, about how a client can access a web-based service and access their personal account. Of course, in the beginning, there was username password, a process we're all too familiar with. Let's just review it. A client memorizes the password, then the client registers with a server by agreeing a username, commonly their email address, and sending that username plus password to the server. The server stores the username and a hash of the password in a password file, or as we call it, a credential database. To authenticate, the client enters their username plus their password on a server's website, typically. The server looks up the username of the credential database, hashes the password and compares with the stored value. If all is good, if the comparison works, then the client is authenticated and allowed access to their account. Now, as we all know, there's a few downsides with this process. The first problem is, since the client basically hands over their credentials to the server, they are wide open to what's known as a phishing attack, where they carelessly hand over their credentials to the wrong entity. Uh, basically, they're fooled into uh, entering their credentials into a website which isn't actually the legitimate website, 
that, that they've handed over therefore their credentials to a bad actor who can then access their account and do a lot of damage second problem uh, is the servers have proven to be incapable of protecting credential databases from being hacked this is a problem that's been around for a long time and we're all aware of the headlines when uh, a big server is hacked and usernames and passwords are revealed uh, it's quite devastating uh, to try and prevent this attack, that's why the hashing is, is used. But hashing is only effective if the password is genuinely unique. And hence the password has to be long and hard to remember. Right. And that, of course, we're all familiar with the, the big complicated passwords we're forced to use these days. And uh, which, in fact, are very hard to remember, intrinsically so. And of course, this is just one factor authentication. If the client loses or reveals their password, they're in trouble. And if it's an e-banking application they're using, well, then they could be in very serious trouble. But of course, uh, username and password is very convenient because you, you carry the password simply around in your head from one place to another. Now, how can we start to fix things? Well, one very powerful idea is to introduce client-side secure hardware. And this greatly improves uh, client-side security and indeed the client user experience. Uh, the client can now easily share a much bigger secret with the server, like a, a cryptographic 128-bit AES key. It doesn't have to memorize this key, it keeps it safely inside its secure hardware vault. It's very similar to keeping valuables inside one of those hotel room vaults. We've all been in hotels where there's a a safe typically in a wardrobe we enter a pin number we put our valuables our passports inside we close the door when we want to uh, gain access to our valuables we enter the same pin number and extract them so it's a common enough uh, conceptually common enough idea and a simple four digit pin pops open the vault and allows access to the value of valuable secret within uh, we, we could, in fact, use a, a biometric in the, uh, in the web context instead of entering a PIN. Uh, if you enter the wrong PIN three times, the vault will not permit any further attempts. There's a kind of three strikes and you're out uh, rule applied. Uh, as before, the server keeps its copy of the client's AES secret, 128-bit key. It'll keep that in a credentials database. Uh, now, to authenticate, we can use a, a more sophisticated method. The server can basically send a random 128-bit challenge to the client. The client accesses their vault, encrypts the challenge with their 128-bit AES key, and returns the result to the server. The server encrypts its own challenge which it, with its copy of the shared key, which it gets from the credential database and compares that with what the client sent. If all is good, if they match, then the client is successfully authenticated. Now, there are a lot of advantages to this method. First of all, as I said, the client side experience is much improved. They just have to remember a four digit pin. Or indeed, as I indicated earlier, we can store a biometric template inside the vault and we can use a facial recognition or a fingerprint biometric to pop open the vault. Phishing attacks are no longer possible because the client's secret actually never leaves its vault, certainly not sent at any stage to the, uh, to the server. The client experience is now two-factor authentication because to authenticate, the client needs, first of all, the secure vault, which is typically their mobile phone, and their memorized PIN number. So two factors, much more secure. But we're not quite happy with this solution because the server is still incapable of protecting the credential database. And of course, the credential database now contains the 128-bit AES keys of every client, right? So it's as vulnerable as ever it was. So one final flourish to try and fix up things and that is, instead of using simple symmetric uh, AES cryptography, use public key cryptography, which seems like a pretty neat idea. The client now stores their private key as before in their vault. 
and the server stores the associated public key in the credential database. Uh, to authenticate, the server again sends a random challenge and the client digitally signs it using their private key and the server uses the public key from the database to verify the signature. And since the credential database now stores only public keys, I mean, who cares if it's hacked? On the face of it, something that's public is not of any value to a hacker. So we would seem to have solved our problem. And this is basically FIDO. Now, you're probably all familiar with FIDO. The FIDO Alliance was established back in 2013. Uh, it was backed by very many major companies and it's had a largely uncritical press up until now. Uh, however, it doesn't appear to have ever been scrutinized or subject to serious uh, cryptographic review. In fact, cryptographers wouldn't really be that interested in the basic FIDO protocol because it uses very old school, old fashioned cryptography and of the type that's not of any interest to current cryptographic uh, cryptographers or researchers. However, it's generally regarded as a good idea and a good thing, and it's been strongly touted as a likely successor, a universal successor to, to username password. However, it's now 2020, and clearly FIDO has been slow to achieve widespread adoption, right, outside of enterprises where it has achieved some level of success. So why the slow uptake? Uh, well, secure hardware is expensive and every manufacturer does it differently. Uh, it's uh, inflexible, being hardware rather than software. Is it secure hardware really secure? Uh, can you be sure there are no manufacturers back doors into the vault? Uh, if you recall my uh, hotel safe analogy, you can bet your life that the hotel manager has a way of opening those safes if the guests should forget their pin number. And in the internet context, we're probably aware of uh, controversies around in, surrounding secure hardware and the possibility of backdoors. There's the whole Huawei issue that uh, was discussed. However, you're, I'll leave that up to you, whatever your opinion is on secure hardware. However, if it is really secure, then if the vault is lost, then clearly so are its contents. And they're lost forever. Uh, if the secure hardware does its job properly, there's no way anyone can can get it back. So you're, you're locked out of your accounts. Uh, on the server side, what about that credential database? Now, as I said previously, it's for, it stores only public keys. So it would appear in the face of it to be really pointless for, for an attacker to try and hack it. But is this really the case? In fact, public key cryptography has a big problem. And that problem is associating the public key with the actual identity of its human owner. So how can you really be sure of the true owner of a public key? Now, this is a problem which can be solved and has been solved very successfully in other contexts. And it can be solved by introducing what's called a PKI, an elaborate public key infrastructure, right? This is used to solve the problems of e-commerce on the internet, uh, very successful technology in that context, right? So uh, public key cryptography in, in working with a public key infrastructure works fine. FIDO doesn't use a PKI. It uses public key cryptography without a PKI. Some of you may be rather surprised to learn that. An attacker therefore, who hacks into the credential database can launch a pretty devastating attack. They can substitute client public keys with their own public keys. And that way, they can gain access to client accounts. So what do FIDO do about this? Well, according to FIDO, such a devastating attack is outside of the scope of the FIDO specifications. So basically, FIDO are washing their hands of this issue. And Let's recall that uh, the attack on the credential database is the main attack vector on username password. So the, the problem of credential database has been hacked has not been fixed by FIDO. It's just as serious a problem as it was with username password. Let's raise another issue. Is FIDO truly two-factor? 
Well, why, we don't dispute the claim that the user's experience is two-factor, it certainly is. The protocol itself is actually not. It would be more accurate to describe it as a two-step protocol, right? Basically, you enter your PIN to access the vault, to extract the secret, to do the authentication. So step one, open the vault with the PIN. Step two, use the secret within to authenticate. And clearly an attacker who can penetrate the vault and extract its secret doesn't require that other factor. It doesn't require the PIN. So in a sense, it's a, the, everything relies on the single factor of the security of the vault. Now, having uh, uh, criticized, if you like, Fido uh, in this way, we, the next thing is to see, is there a better way? Right, and a good starting point is to ask, has cryptography really got nothing better to offer than the public key cryptography of the 1970s? Right, well, let's start first of all by imagining a better solution. And then let's see, can the cryptography step up to the mark to provide us with such a solution? First thing we'll do is we'll separate registration from authentication, right? To do this, we'll introduce a distributed trust authority. We call this a DTA. This DTA checks credentials and issues clients with secrets. Each individual TA just issues one part of this secret, right? The, the idea here being to ensure that there's no single point of failure in our system. And the DTA also issues a single secret to the server. Actually, each DTA uh, individually sends a part of the secret to the server. The server simply adds them all together to form the complete secret. Each client similarly constructs their full secret from its parts. It, it gets one part from each of the TAs. Typically there's two or three, maybe four TAs. Adds all those parts together and then subtracts from the whole a four digit pin of their own choosing. The remaining part of their secret is just a big blob of data, right? Typically maybe 256 bits in size. So that's their two factors, the blob of data and the four digit pin. Where do they store the blob of data? Well, maybe they store it in their browser. Maybe if they're lucky enough to have secure hardware, that maybe that's a, an appropriate place to store it. However, client-side hardware is not a requirement. That blob of data and the pin are the two factors required for authentication. One is useless without the other. So the, the absence of one, if you like, protects the other. That's the beauty of two-factor authentication. When authentication is required, the two factors are simply added back together again, right at the moment of authentication. And the, the beauty of our imagined solution is there's no need for any client side, uh, sorry, server side credential database, right? So no server side credential database, hence nothing to hack, right? So we remove the uh, the main, the main uh, attack vector for both username, password, and for FIDO, we simply don't have a credential database, right? The protocol we imagine is uh, similar to FIDO and it's a, it's a challenge response protocol between the client and the server, right? So again, in, in exactly the same way, we prevent phishing attacks. We still need to implement three strikes and you're out uh, against uh, pin number guesses. And now we move responsibility of that to the server. So there's our imagined solution. Uh, seems to make perfect sense. Why haven't we had it before? Well, with the 1970s legacy public key cryptography, it's actually not possible to do that, what we just imagined. You can, you can try, you can play around with the mathematics, but you won't come up with a solution. It's simply not possible. However, cryptography has not stood still since the 1970s. Uh, in the year 2000, there was a major breakthrough in cryptographic research with the discovery of what we now call pairing-based cryptography, right? And for the last decade or so, this has achieved a level of maturity and acceptance within the cryptographic community. Uh, it's, it's important, it was indicated by the fact that it solved many open problems in cryptography, uh, notably that of what's called identity-based encryption. This is an idea that was thought of in the 1980s, but no one could figure out any way of doing it with the, the public key cryptography of the time. But with the discovery of pairing-based cryptography, identity-based encryption was solved almost immediately.
which shows the power of this new cryptographic tool. And the good news is it also solves our problem, today's problem, of true multi-factor authentication in software without any requirement for hardware. Uh, our solution based on this technology we call MPIN. And if you read the full paper and the references to that, you'll get more information about it. Uh, so with this solution, we can dispense with secure hardware on the client side and we remove the credential database on the server side. And in that way, we achieve simple, robust two-factor authentication, which could be extended to multi-factor. So at this stage, I've finished my talk. Uh, any questions? Uh, if you've, a lot of your questions will be answered perhaps by uh, having a look at the full paper, right? And I thank you very much for your attention to this talk.
Thank you for everyone to listen our presentation. The topic of my paper is security analysis and improvement of autonomic hash table based auditing scheme for cloud storage. Outline of my presentation is as follows. The first part, I want to induce the background of this research. The second part, we review the workflow of a recently proposed public auditing scheme for cloud storage named as DHTPA. The third part, we present our security analysis for the DHTPA, and then we introduce a possible method to solve the above mentioned weakness. Well, let's move on to the first part of this topic with the rapid development of information technology. The Internet data has shown increasing growth. From the two pictures, we also can see that the data has been getting very and very large. Therefore, with the explosive growth of data in today's world, the significance of cloud storage service is more and more highlighted. Taking the advantages of powerful storage, unlimited access, and affordable management, Cloud storage providers have attracted an increasing number of individuals and organizations to enjoy this service. By shifting the data from their local storage system to a remote cloud server, individuals and organizations can greatly relieve themselves from the burden of data management. However, outsourcing the, data, the local data to a remote cloud server still faces some security and privacy challenges. For example, the cloud infrastructure may suffer from some inevitable failures that leads to uh, data corruption. But the cloud service provider may hide the accident to avoid the financial loss. Therefore, maintaining the integrity and the privacy of cloud data is a key point for promoting the service quality of cloud storage. To address these security issues, many public dating schemes have been proposed to verify the integrity of cloud data, which allowed an honest but curious public auditor to verify the integrity of outsourced data periodically without downloading the entire data file from the remote cloud server. And the public auditing system model consists of three participants, as shown in this picture. To get a better trade-off between the dynamic property and the auditing efficiency, Tian proposed a new dynamic hash table-based public auditing scheme, called, uh, called, uh, which is called as a DHTPA. They proved that the DHTPA, DHTPA is much more efficient than recently proposed dynamic public auditing scheme. They also claimed that DHTPA is skewed in terms of resisting the signature forger attack and the proof forger attack. However, we demonstrate that the scheme is vulnerable to signature forger attack. That the cloud service provider can forge a valid signature of any data block with which the CSP can further generate a forged audit auditing proof to pass the TPS verification. By providing a new mathematical attack, our work is helpful for, for cryptographers and engineers to design and implement more secure and efficient public auditing schemes for cloud storage. Now, let's move on to the second part, the review of DHTPA. To start with, some definitions are present. E is reviewed as a bilinear map, where G1 and G2 are two additive cyclic groups with the same prime order P. H is a skewed hash function. Letter F denotes the other sort of file, which is divided into M blocks. Now, now let's review. 
Let's uh, review the concrete construction of tier DHTPA. The first step of this phase is to is to generate a key pair at the pivotal shows. The second step is to generate data information. The ID denotes the latest denoted the unique identifier of F. And the file denotes the latest version information of data blocks, where VITI are the version and the time step of block MI respectively. Then the user sends ID file to the TPA as a delegation of data auditing. The third step is to generate a signature. The user first computes the file tag row and then compute the signature for each data block as sigma i. Then it uh, outsources the file f and with along with uh, its file tag and the block signatures to the remote cloud server. Of only saving the signature sigma i, the CSP computes a tag for each data block as follows. Which den which den denotes as a theta uh, i. After that, the CSP will store will store the file tag and the block tags along with the file F in the storage system. This is a simple workflow of the setup phase. The verification phase is run between the TPA and the CSP. The first step is to check the file identifier. The TPA first verifies the file signature using the public key PK after receiving the tag row. If the verification fails, TPA reviews the user's delegation. Otherwise, the TPA launches a challenge for data auditing on behalf of the user. The second step is to generate challenge information. The TPA randomly selects a C element subset as, as I from the set uh, from the original set as the index set of the block to be checked. Then it sets R and uh, the chosen index index set and the random element SI as a uh, the auditing challenge and send it to the CSP. Where SI is a random number from the field ZP. The third step is to generate a proof. After on receiving the challenge, the CSP starts to compute the corresponding proof. As the two equations to show, Next, it sends it sends the auditing proof back to the TPA as the auditing proof. To perform to perform the verification, the TPA first computes the value edge, and then it verifies the proof by checking the following equation. This picture is a simple workflow of the verification phase. We now move on to the third part, the craft analysis of DHTPA. The setup phase is the same with the original scheme. Now, let's introduce how a signature forgery attack, as we mentioned before, works in the verification phase. The signature forgery attack is implemented by a monitor CSP. 
as the third of step shown in this picture. A malicious CSP can delete the original data block MI with and replace with a small block MI prime that takes up much less storage space than MI. It can first compute the value key as shown in the picture. Then it generates a new sigma signature sigma I prime and a new bell tag set I prime for its chosen data block MI prime. Next, it can replace the message signature pair as sigma i mi with sigma i prime mi prime. Up on, up on receiving the auditing challenge for the TPA, it can still compute an auditing proof as an audio source SP do. Then, the TPA can also verify the correctness of the forger the auditing proof. From the equations, we can know that by replacing the original data block and its corresponding signature, the malicious CSP can still pass the verification of a TPA. We now go to the last part a possible improvement for the DHTPA. In the bow attack, an, an advisory, we also called a malicious CSP that use the value of K to compute a legal signature sigma I prime for another data block M I prime, and then construct a legal proof to pass the TPA audit. Therefore, to withstand this stack, we should prevent the adversary from computing K to obtain a valued signature. To achieve this goal, we can modify the signature generation step and tag the signature step as follows. We first introduced how to modify the signature generation. Given each data block MI and the public key U, the user generates a corresponding signature sigma I by following caution. Well, alpha is the user's private key generated in key generation step. Next, the user sends some related information to the CSP, which is the file F, the file tag row, and the signature and the signature sigma for all data blocks. We can see that, compared with the original DHTPA, we exploit a new private key to send the data block, with which the adversary is not able to obtain the forged signature sigma I prime, because nobody knows the private key alpha except the data owner. Then, we introduce how to modify the tag generation step. Based on the received signature sigma i, the CSP generates a tag theta i for each data block m i, namely as the following questions. Compared to the original DHTPA, we replace the public key y with g, which are both generated in key generation step. The, the, left, the left equation is a correct analysis of our modification to the DHTPA. From the correctness analysis, we can see that the proposed method can be used to edit the cloud data at the cost of only small performance loss in computing block signatures. By adding a rather exponent to the original tag, it will break the linear relationship between different messages tags. And from this point, it may improve the security level of the original DHDPA scam by avoiding the signature forgery attack described above. At last, we make a conclusion to our paper. In this paper, 
we introduced a new kind of signature forgery attack to the public auditing scams. And this work is made to help cryptographers and engineers design or implement more secure and efficient signature schemes or public auditing schemes by avoiding this kind of attack. Although we give a possible improvement to the original DHDPA to resist the proposed attack, we will be still devoted ourselves to design more skilled and efficient public auditing schemes for cloud storage in the near future. Okay, hello everyone. Uh, today I will give a presentation of our paper published in this conference, SBNCE. Uh, our paper's title is a Public Auditing Framework Against the Malicious Auditors uh, for Cloud Storage Based on Blockchain. Uh, in this paper, we try to use the blockchain technology uh, to solve the the managers auditors problem existed in the public auditing schemes. Uh, first, we want to introduce the motivation of our paper. Uh, in the traditional uh, the public 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 auditing uh, system model, there are four roles like user, cloud server, KGC, and auditor. Uh, the KGC is uh, res respon responsible for uh, generating the keys and uh, generating the public parameter parameters uh, uh, for the, the other roles. The user is yes, the cloud service uh, user. He wants to upload the data to the cloud server to uh, reduce the reduce the storage burden in the local machine, uh, but the cloud server may delete or corrupt uh, the data, and uh, do not tell the truth because uh, the the CS the CS may uh, need to respond responsible for his mistake, uh, but so so the CS uh, will choose to lie to the user. So it is a good choice to use the auditor, or the uh, trusted auditor, to do the thing, to do this task, uh, auditing task, uh, for the fairness. On the other hand, the user is, uh, is, maybe a mobile phone, and the other set, uh, IoT set, IoT devices like the sensors, uh, so. So use the auditors. Is a good choice to uh, is, is a very good choice, but in the real world, uh, there is not existed a, a, a fully trusted uh, auditors. We call it the malicious auditors. Uh, he, the, the malicious auditors may uh, do some attacks to the security of the system. Uh, uh, so in this paper, we want to try to solve this problem with the blockchain technology. Uh, this is the, our proposed framework. We can see that the, uh, in the in this part, uh, they are same client CSP and KGC, but the auditors, uh, there are several auditors, not a single auditors in the in these uh, uh, contact layer. We can deploy our uh, our proof verify algorithm as a smart contact uh, on the auditors on the contact layer, and uh, when the, when the clients want to uh, to check the integrity uh, stop in the CSP, uh, he can send the challenging information to these auditors, 
and uh, the CS the cloud server generates the proof to the auditor auditors and auditors can uh, auditor can check the results. Uh, if 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 uh, we choosing the uh, secure model, all the auditors do the same things to check the full part of the of the data. But if we want to improve the efficient efficiency, uh, we can divide the the data into n parts and and save them to n auditor separately. And uh, the auditors, each auditor can get the result, can can get the result and exchange it with the others, and all the auditors will get the the um, the the full full results, and uh, store it in into the store storage layer. Only the, the only the the malicious attack auditors. Can control more than 50% auditors. Otherwise, he, he or she cannot uh, tamper a uh, result. Uh, here now is the detailed schemes. Uh, in our details, first the setup setup phase. In setup phase, input the secret parameter KTC generates the system parameters at master key, and uh, like with the following steps. Uh, first, uh, selects a prime num queue. Two groups G1, G2, and uh, finally a pair E. Then the KGC selects a big B in touch as randomly as the uh, must key and keeps X secretly. Uh, the KGC computes the PPOP as the public key uh, and publish the system parameters with like Q, G1, G2, P, E, and uh, five hash functions and the PPOP. Uh, in the then the client reaches to the KGC to extract the partial private key with the following steps. Client submits his 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 identity IDU to the KGC. After receiving client's identity IDU, KGC chooses big a random big integer TU and computes T big TU and HU and SDU and sends SDU TU to the to the client set secret value. The client choose big integer x u randomly as his secret value, and the client keeps x u secretly. At last, the uh, uh, client sets s s k u equals to pass s u and x u as his private key, and the client sets his public key as follows. Uh, PU equals to SC multiplied P. Uh, PQ equal, uh, also consists of two parts, TU and PU. In target generation, the client computes KO equals to this hash, hash value, and Q is also hash value. The client computes SI and Sends M I I D I S I N R this pair these elements to the CSP where I D I is the unicode identity of M I R is a random number and R can be calculated as this equation. Uh, M M I S I means uh, the chunk of the M I M I means the I data blocks of the data file. Before we upload the data and the computer check, we need to divide the data file into n blocks, and the mi means i block. Then auditor auditor have two parts: challenge and proof gen. Uh, the client generates a challenging information as a select l elements sub subset. From the set one and uh, one to n, and uh, generate this subset J, and uh, select the random number VJ for each J in J. Then uh, generate the count challenging information ch challenge, and then broadcast it in the network. The CSB and all the auditors can get it.
approach everything the challenge information channel channel from the client the CSP generates a proof which proves of the correct position of selected block as close. Uh, like this, compute these elements, and then broadcast the information proof to the auditors. Uh, proof verify. After receiving the proof, the auditors can check the equation like this. First, uh, compute H O and Q and Q. The auditor checks the what the equation holds. Uh, this is for Pylea for pairing. If this holds us put 1 repre represents the correct storage of data file otherwise output z 0 to indicate that corruption uh, security and efficiency comparison we compare our scheme with CRP and IDBA. We can see that our scheme achieves more security properties. And from the computation cost comparison, we can see that our scheme is a little higher than the other, the other two schemes in the user side. But in the audit side, our scheme uh, uh, greatly, greatly uh, reduce the computation cost and the communica communica communication cost is same with IDBA and a little, a, a little higher than CRPA. Uh, from the security and efficiency analysis, we can see that our scheme, our scheme uh, achieves uh, 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 more security, security properties and uh, a little higher, a little higher uh, compu computation cost compa compared with the, the other schemes. Okay, thanks for your listening. Thank you. Hello everyone, my name is Li Cheng, the co-authors of this paper are Professors Yang Li and Ma Jianfeng. Our paper title is a Square and a Variable Outsourcing Scope of uh, Machine Learning Data. First, introduce the research background. According to what Kirli stores on his blog, in 2020, everyone will generate 1.0 MB of data per second. In internet, users will uh, generate 250 uh, billion uh, batches of data uh, per day. At the same time, a larger moment at uh, data has also attracted attracted uh, the attention to uh, uh, many uh, organizations, uh, such as Amazon, uh, Microsoft, uh, Google, IBM, and so on. They use LT driver to collect uh, user data and analyze it to better server use. Secondly, the drivers collect a uh, larger amount of user data, which contain a uh, larger amount of provide, provide uh, information. Uh, therefore, uh, provides and the security issues cannot uh, be ignored. At the same time, due to relevant legal or police reasons, Mobile phones have to carry out more and more computing uh, operations. However, the com computing power is uh, mobile driver uh, is limited. 
Google Input Method is a good example. Uh, Google Input Method and the related intelligent input method will learn to user input habits so as to better recommend to the user. Uh, therefore, in there to find a balance uh, between efficiency and the security, we propose the EVPP. There are three parts in the solution. Uh, network edge nodes, mm. network uh, net nodes, uh, such as uh, mobile phone, uh, smart, uh, uh, brilliant, uh, and so on. Edge servers and uh, uh, cloud servers. In order to uh, ensure the time linear uh, computing, uh, we do not consider a remote uh, cloud servers here. Uh, the edge servers nodes uh, assist uh, the network edge node uh, in data cal calculation. Uh, we are simply uh, referred to as user uh, behind the network edge nodes. At the same time, data security and uh, privacy issues need to be considered. Uh, while ensuring the reduction of user calculation overhead, uh, the accuracy of the calculation result must also be uh, guaranteed. As shown in the figure, uh, the uh, scheme uh, in the paper, uh, in this paper, uh, is applied to uh, two edge servers nodes. The two edge servers nodes can uh, include the servers nodes <coughs> node in the red box. Uh, is used to calculate. Uh, the inverse uh, matrix of uh, the invertible uh, matrix uh, for the user and return the invertible uh, matrix to the user. Uh, the server's node uh, in the blue box uh, is his, the user in the outsourcing uh, calculation of data. Uh, this paper takes a uh, linear regression uh, as an uh, example and uh, use a uh, uh, gradation uh, descent uh, algorithm to find uh, the optimal, optimal uh, weather value uh, by the <coughs> splitting the formula uh, on the left. The following two formulas uh, are obtained. Uh, it is easy to see from the uh, comparison uh, that the uh, main cost of calculation is at the uh, formula delta. Delta also requires uh, outsourcing calculation. Then, by constructing the Bell's matrix, we added the, the obfuscated uh, matrix and the verification uh, factor uh, to the matrix, uh, such as the uh, following four uh, matrix. It is not uh, difficult. Uh, difficult uh, to see uh, through the natural uh, uh, matrix operation uh, that the black uh, matrix can ensure the uh, accuracy of the uh, calculation. At the same time, uh, it can also be effectively uh, verified uh, by calculation. Uh, the mm, uh, factor. Uh, this paper uh, consists of uh, six algorithms. Algorithms. Uh, first, uh, look at 
at algorithm one. Uh, the uh, the generator algorithm uh, uh, was sourced uh, data, uh, which is uh, mainly used to uh, generate a fair scattered uh, data. The first seven steps are all the processes uh, of um, matrix above uh, cash uh, require the the prepare uh, the outsourcing matrix. Uh, in the S step, uh, the matrix generated in the uh, provost <coughs> seven uh, steps uh, are connected and uh, finally the uh, matrix uh, to the outsourcing is uh, generated. Uh, algorithm 2, we want to send data to the algorithm <coughs> at the server's uh, node. Uh, this data includes the first outsourcing <coughs> matrix generator uh, by the algorithm and uh, the uh, corresponding uh, calculation uh, ruler. Uh, after receiving uh, the above data, uh, the add server's nodes calculate uh, the third data uh, according to the uh, calculation uh, ruler and return it uh, to the user after of returning the data store. Organization 3 uh, is the process of gradient uh, descent algorithm. Uh, by extracting uh, the uh, corresponding uh, matrix uh, information from a uh, returned data store uh, from a uh, uh, calculation. The corresponding uh, calculated value uh, can be obtained. Then through a uh, local operation, uh, <coughs> the uh, gradient uh, information uh, well, this time is uh, obtained and uh, paired with the uh, provided general uh, gradient uh, information. Uh, if the optimal value is not retired, uh, it will return uh, uh, algorithm 2 and uh, continue to perform out sourcing uh, operation. Algorithm Four is the uh, verification operation. Uh, the user uh, compares the uh, result returned by outsourcing with the value of the uh, local verification matrix. If the results uh, are different, it means that the edge service node uh, did not fulfill. Uh, perform outsourcing uh, calculations. When the uh, worry uh, faction fails, uh, <coughs> the user will execute uh, algorithm uh, file uh, to terminate uh, communication with the edge service node. At the same time, the user will execute uh, algorithm 6 Algorithm 5 is the end of outsourcing task algorithm. Uh, the algorithm uh, will uh, execute in the following two situations. Uh, one, the user found uh, uh, fed, uh, that the algorithm edge uh, server's node uh, is uh, malicious. Uh, two, the gradient uh, descent uh, 
algorithm uh, fed uh, to optimal optimal uh, value. In algorithm six, the user uh, collects uh, the uh, verification uh, matrix uh, calculation rulers, uh, user identity, and uh, edge servers uh, nodes identity related it, uh, uh, to this out sourcing uh, tags in to uh, even word. Uh, and see it uh, for other nodes to uh, you verify. Next, we look at the uh, efficiency of the paper. The figure on the left is the operation result use the Burton House Press data <coughs> side. Uh, the figure on the right is the time. Uh, Consume patient the performing to a hundred iterations on data uh, of different uh, size. It can be seen uh, that the uh, scheme in this paper have uh, certain uh, advantages. Uh, finally, we paper will be summarized. Uh, data size, uh, squarity, and the uh, wise in the uh, process of outsourcing uh, computing cannot uh, be ignored. In order to help uh, mobile drivers to better uh, perform uh, mobile training, uh, such as machine learning, uh, this paper proposes the EVPP scheme. The solution not only efficiency re uh, reduces uh, the calculation overhead, but also uh, affects uh, the re results of uh, outsourced uh, calculation. Uh, in addition, uh, we also give some uh, suggestion on <coughs> on how to. Uh, establish uh, trust uh, mechanism in the uh, uh, system. Uh, this all. Thank you all, experience and uh, scholars. Hello everyone, thanks for watching this video. This is the keynote presentation of our paper. Sport Vector Machine Interim Detection Scheme based on Cloud for Collaboration. Now I will give a brief introduction for our paper. As you can see, I have divided my talk into four main sections. What's wrong? How to solve it? How to solve it specifically and results. The rapid development of Internet of Things technology, the popularity of 5G networks, the emergence of a large number of industrial internets have increased the network transmission capacity requirements, data distribution processing capabilities, and real time performance. Compared to traditional cloud computing, the new factors of for computing also create entirely new security and privacy protection issues. Let's look at the structure of for computing. Because the fog node is closer to the user, it's more vulnerable to subject to a tank. Intern detection is the second security barrier behind the firewall, which can quickly detect security risks in the network. Traditional single intern detection schemes have problems such as slow detection speed, 
and low accuracy and no longer adapt to the requirements of full computing and edge computing environments in response speed and high real-time performance. Aiming at this problem, we propose a lightweight intrusion detection model based on cloud fog collaboration. Our contributes in this study can be summarized in the following three points. The first is based on the classic three-layer architecture of computing. We proposed a lightweight intrusion detection model based on CloudFog collaborative sport vector machine. The second is the, prin the principal component and analysis process is added in the data processing stage. The third is PSO is added to select SVM parameters to speed up training. As you can see, our scheme can be divide, divided into six steps. The first step is establish a communication link. The terminal device access the full computing network through the fog node. Due to the uh, higher uh, hydrogenity hy of user terminals, the fog node provides network connections to each terminal device through different protocols and uh, collects the data generated by each terminal device in real time. The second step is the cloud server pre-process and trains the original data. The entire training set is stored in the cloud server and the entire training pr process is complete, uh, completed in the cloud server to generate a training model and save it. The third step is the fog node sends a detection instruction. After the fog node established a communication link with the terminal device, it, collect, uh, it collects a large amount of network data generated by the terminal device and sends a detection instruction to the cloud server. The fourth step is the cloud server sends the training model. After receiving the detection instruction, the cloud server sends the data processing model and the trained classification detection, detection model to the fog node. And the fifth step is fog node detection process. After receiving the model, the fog node uses the model for data processing and the detection and generates detection results. And the last step is intrusion response. The detected abnormal data are sent to the intrusion response model and the intrusion response model performs the corresponding processing. Network data generally have high dimensional characters resulting in a longer training time required for intrusion detection. Compared with tr traditional intrusion detection, detection algorithms in fog environments require shorter training times, are lightweight, and have higher detection accuracy. Therefore, before training, dimension reduction processing is performed on the training data to eliminate eliminate the correlation between attributes and uh, maximize the retention of or original data information. The core idea of PCA is to transform a set of variables that may be related to a set of largely uncorrelated variables through, through transmission. This method can reduce the storage cost while removing the correlation of different dimensions. P 
PCA and PCO optim optimized sport vector machine for internal detection. Uh, this following six steps. The first is use principal component analysis to analyze the original data. The second step is initialize the particle swarm position and the voxy. The third step is calculate the fitness value of all particle swarms. The first step is find the individual extreme value and global extreme value. The fifth step is determine whether the end condition of optimi optimization is met. The sixth step is give the opti optim optimal uh, parameters are given to the SVM model. Let's look at the figure five. Uh, let's look at the figure four. The figure four shows the comparison of detection precision between the SVM classifier and other classifiers when PCA dimension reduction is used to retain 99, or 99 points of the original dataset information. As seen from Figure 4, after PCA dimension reduction, SVM classification has better detection accuracy for various attack types than at both ELM and DCNG. And uh, let's look at the figure 5. Figure 5 shows the comparison of the detection rate between the SVM classifier and other classifiers when PCA is used to reduce the dimensional, uh, dimensionality and retain 99 points of the original dataset information. The PCA SVM classifier has a high detection rate for the R2L, dose, probe, and the normal types. Be because the con uh, con content of U2R attack type data in the dataset is very low, the detection rate of U2R is low. Also, let's look at the figure, figure 6. This is the comparison of false alarm rate of four classifiers between and after PCA. We can see between and after PCA, the SVM classifiers have, <coughs> have very low false alarm, uh, false alarm rate than any other uh, classifiers. According to the results in Table 6, the PCA SVM algorithm has relatively high accuracy and less detection time when applied to intrusion detection in a fog environment. The main reason is that the, uh, <coughs> the reduction of data makes the calculation speed faster. The PSO algorithm is applied to the selection of SVM parameters, which increases the training speed. In the fog environment, data training in the cloud server and the detection in the fog end are uh, adopted. The light model can greatly reduce the detection time. Now we can get our conclusions. The network where the fog nodes are located is highly dynamic and highly real-time, which pre presents a new challenge to the intrusion detection of, of fog computing. This paper proposed a cloud fog uh, collaborative intrusion detection model, which is added during Pre-processing PCA uh, dimensionality reduction, eliminating the correlation between various 
on deliminations of network data and reducing the storage and uh, calculation overhead. The dataset is trained in the cloud server with an SVM classifier. Where the selection of SVM parameters is optimized by PSO and saving the training model greatly saves the detection time at the fog nodes. The proposed model is verified on the KDD CAP 99 dataset and several experiments have demonstrated the advantages of this model from different perspectives and have contributed to solving the problems caused by resourcing constraints in for computing. That's all I have to say about our paper. Thank you for listening and if there are any questions, I would be pleased to answer them.
This topic is pixel grouping based image hashing for DIBR 3D image. I will introduce five parts. In the first part, I will introduce why we should design a hashing scheme for DIBR 3D image. Uh, in part two, I will show how to perform DIBR process. In part three, I will introduce the proposed image hashing scheme. In part four, I will give, give the experimental results. Finally, I will make the conclusion. Depth image-based rendering is a kind of 3D representation technology by which vertical right image and the left image are generated from the center image. Then viewers can easily get the 3D perception with the vertical image prior. In the digital communication model of DIBR 3D image, receiver performs DIBR operation to generate the virtual image prior for 3D video. As a fact, matter of fact, either of the center image, the virtual image may suffer from redistributions and uh, temporary. In order to resolve this problem, Robust perceptual hashing has been widely used for digital multimedia protect protection as a variety of copies for the center image and the virtual image existing. Image hashing can also help us to find a similar one and detect the tempered. In this paper, we focus on designing a robust image hashing scheme for DIBR 3D image identification. In DIBR system, virtual right image and left image are generated from the corresponding center image with pixels mapping. In a sense, virtual images have similar visual content with their corresponding center image, which demands the hashing method should identify the virtual images with the same contents as the center image. As shown in this figure, uh, this figure also shows the character of image hashing for DIBR 3D image. Um, now I will introduce how to perform DIBR. DIBR is a process generating the virtual images from center image according to its corresponding depth image. This figure illustrates the relationship between the center image and the virtual image. Suppose P is a point in the space, CC, CL, and CR represent the center viewpoint, left viewpoint, and the right viewpoint respectively. F, F represents the focal length of the center viewpoint, C is the depth of P. X, C, X, L, and X, R are the X coordinate of pixel in the center image. The virtual left image and the virtual right image Tx is the baseline distance value, of which is equal to distance between the left and the right viewpoints. As these geometric relations show, x coordinate of pixel in virtual image is compute can be computed. Our DIBR 3D image hashing algorithm includes the following steps. Uh, the original center image is filter, filtered with a Gaussian kernel low pass filter to get the low frequency, and we standardize the low frequency of center image for hashing generation. Then pixels of normalized low frequency image are divided into different group, groups according to the histogram shape. Then these pixel group, groups are used to construct a secondary, secondary image, which is, is almost unchangeable under geometric distortions and slightly changes after DIB operation. 
Lastly, the secondary image is decomposed by non-negative matrix factor ratio to get the coefficient matrix, and the final hash is construct constructed with its coefficients. Low pass field filtering filtering is adopted to extract the low frequency component of original center image, aiming to enhance robustness of proposed hydrogen scheme to some common content preserving manipulations. The frequency component IC low of original center image IC is obtained as, as this formula. Uh, in this paper, only pixels with M different uh, gray levels are randomly selected to construct a secondary image, aiming to ensure the security of a proposed hashing oxygen. With a K-based sequence, M gray levels are selected for pixel grouping. The site of selected gray level is represented as this formula. After resizing L0 to M plus M, pixels with LB neighboring gray levels in HM are selected to form a pixel group. In total, N groups are formed. Suppose Ji be one of the pixel group. In order to form the ice column of the secondary image, we sort and resize Ji to a new factor, vector, size the k plus 1. Then the secondary image is modeled as this formula. Since the histo histogram shape is almost unchangeable under geometric distortions and slightly change after DIB operations, features extracted from the secondary image way also have the, this property. NMF is used to get the base matrix and the coefficient matrix. Uh, Concatenate the, the coefficient matrix to obtain the final hash vector. The length of the hash vector is n plus r, where n is the number of pixel groups and r is the rank for nmf. In this paper, correlation coefficient is taken as a metric to measure similarity between two image hash vectors. The con correlation co uh, coefficient is, is defined as this formula. According to the above formula, a bigger S value shows that the input the input image is most similar with the original corresponding center image. Uh, it, is, it is clear that our DIBR 3D image hydrogen scheme can identify the virtual images with the visual contents the same as the original center one. <clears throat> now we will show I will show the experimental results. The first one is the uh, discrimination. One hundred and twenty different color images are selected from the ground truth database in order to test uh, the discriminative capability of proposed hashing. The the hash the hash vectors are generated from these images. Then 700 and 140 correlation coefficients are computed between each pair of different hash vectors. If the threshold is set as 0 0.92, 0 0.32% pairs of different images are identified with a similar content. No pair of different image is identified with a similar content when the threshold is set to uh, 0 0.98. The second will show the pro 
perceptual robustness. Firstly, four pairs of center and depth image are selected from the database. Then, uh, uh, each each what you uh, in out each. Each material image pair and the center image are attacked by the content preserving operations list, uh, listed in the following table. Hash, hash is ex extracted from the center image, material image, and uh, their distorted version are generated with our hashing scheme in order to calculate the identification uh, accuracy rate. The distorted versions are generated by attacking uh, the center and the material image according to 10 classes of common content preserving operations. In this paper, MATLAB is exploited to implement these 10 classes operations with different uh, parameters. These operations include common signal and uh, geometric uh, distortion. Attacks. As shown in this figure, no pair of visually identical image is identified as different content when the threshold is set to 0 0.96. In order to show the identification performance of our DIBR 3D image uh, hashing scheme, it is better than some other ex existing traditional 2D hashing schemes. Two kinds of uh, uh, traditional image hashing schemes are selected for experimental comparisons. One is the shape context and the local feature points based uh, uh, hashing algorithm. And uh, the other is the ring partition ring partition and NMF-based uh, hashing algorithm. Suppose I see uh, be the site of an original center image, then when generated the compact hash for each of the center image. In this paper, we use correlation coefficient as a performance matrix to evaluate the distance between two different uh, hash vectors. Suppose HICI is a hash vector of one of the center image site, and HIQ is a query hash vector and of this total version for either of the center image or their corresponding material images. Then we calculate the correlation coefficient between HIQ and HICI, and the query image is identified as IS original center image as this formula. Higher <coughs> identification accuracy rate means that the image attacked by common content preserving operations can still be identified high similar perceptual content with the original one, no matter attacked by common, uh, common content preserving operations. When considering the DIBR 3D image identification, high, high, high identification performs means that the material images should be identified having a similar perceptual contact with their corresponding center image. In this paper, FRR and FAR are also used to evaluate the robustness of proposed DIBR 3D image hashing scheme. As shown in this figure, the FRR and FAR are zero when the threshold is set from 0 0.86 to 0 0.93. This, this experiment shows that a proposed hydrogen scheme is robust to common signal and geometric distortion attacks. To enhance the security of hydrogen scheme, a secret key is usually used in the process 
of feature extraction and feature comparison to generate the final hash as a result. The k-based hashing scheme is k-dependent, making the hash unpredictable to prevent or unauthorized access. In the proposed hashing scheme, only pixels with m different grid levels are used to construct a secondary image using a k-based sequence to select pixel growth. The security of proposed hashing scheme is enhanced to value to validate key dependence of a proposed hashing scheme for a major are adopted as shown in this figure uh, these figures for each image hash hashes are generated with 100 different cases then we calculate the correlation Conferences between the original k based hash and uh, uh, hashes with different cases. It can be found that all co correlation conferences between different uh, hashes um, of the four images are smaller. It should be noted, no, noted that the parameters of hash generation are kept unchanged except the k based sequence for selecting pixel group in this experiment. As these four fingers show, uh, that the security of a proposed hashing scheme is enhanced with a key-based sequence to select pixel groups. And in this paper, we proposed a pixel grouping and NMF-based DIBR 3D image hashing scheme, which can be used for virtual image identification, uh, authentication, and, uh, and so on. Low-pass filtering and uh, histogram shape-based uh, pixel grouping are the key steps to make a proposed hashing scheme robust to common content preserving manipulations and the um, histogram, histogram shape to grouping and the DIB operation, operations ensure that our DIBR 3D image hashing scheme also have better performance for material image identification. The experiment results have shown that the proposed DIBR 3D image hashing resists common content preserving manipulations, including signal distortion attacks and geometric distortion attacks. However, the proposed hashing uh, method may identify an uh, input image with different content to be very identical when the input image has the same histogram shape. We will solve this problem in the future work. That's all. Thank you. Hello everyone, I'm Xin Zhanghui. I appreciate the opportunity to give this talk to you. The title of my talk is Improved Conditional Differential Analysis on NLFSR-based block cipher Cotton32 with MILP. The outline of my talk is as follows. Let's begin with introduction. To provide the security needed in many constrained environments, such as RFID tags and wireless sensor networks, a number of lightweight ciphers, including present uh, Cotton and Cotton family, have been proposed. Cotton and Cotton family were proposed in 2009. They use nonlinear feedback shift registers. NLFSR, as well as linear key schedule. Both Carton and Cotton have three variants. In this paper, we focus on Carton 32, the 32 bit Carton variant. Carton family ciphers have been analyzed by extensive 
cryptanalysis. The results are listed in Table 1. It can be seen from Table 1. In reference 14, uh, 14 uh, Neil Wolf used conditional differential cryptanalysis and recovered four equivalent qubits for 78 rounds of cut 32 in the single key scenario. In reference to Martin has proposed a uh, 91 round distinguisher with the time complexity being 2 to the power of 32 encryptions. These two results are practical single key results. Reference Reference 15, give an conditional differential analysis in related case scenario. The other results listed in Table 1, which can be seen from the details. Each time, complexity is too high to present a practical attack. Other contributions. It is the first time to use Mixed Integer Linear Programming, MILP, to automatically search an initial difference and conditions for conditional differential cryptanalysis. We propose an we propose an approach to detect the bias in the difference of the update bit. Combined with standard differential attack, we extend the conditional differential cryptanalysis. We give the best attacks known so far with practical time complexities in a single key scenario. All of our source codes and experimental results are available um, at this URL. Part 2 uh, Preliminary Description of Carton32 Carton32 has a plain text and cipher text size of 32 bits and a key size of 80 bits. The two NLFSRs um, have lengths 13 and 19, and we denote their states at round T by ST and LT respectively. In initialization, the plain text is loaded into these two uh, registers. The least significant bit of the plain text is loaded in bit uh, 18 of register L. The most significant bit of the plain text is, logic, is loaded in bit 0 of register S. Each round, S and L, are shifted one bit in the uh, direction of the red arrow. And the new computed bits are loaded in the uh, most significant bits of register S and L. The two new bits are produced according to equation 1 and equation 2. Figure 1 depicts the round function. After 254 rounds of the cipher, the state of the um, registers are then exported as the cipher text. In these two equations, two um, subkey bits and uh, uh, AT are needed each round. The master key is loaded into an 80-bit linear feedback shift register and new subkey bits are generated by this linear feedback relation. Each round, the LFS are clocked twice. 80 is a round constant generated by an 8-bit LFSR using this recursive relation. Um, this is the seed value. <coughs> Conditional differential cryptanalysis was introduced at Crypt 1993. Uh, uh, it is a very popular technique in hash function cryptanalysis. Now, Wolf first apply it on an LFSR based crypt uh, system in um, Azure crypt 2010 and has been successfully used to attack round reduced variants of carton and potential ciphers. Let us review the 
idea of the conditional differential cryptanalysis. After choosing an initial difference, it started the propagation of the input difference through a crypt system and identifies conditions on uh, internal state base to prevent difference propagation whenever possible. By taking the plain text pairs confirming with these conditions as input, biases can be detected in differences of update base at some rounds. The bit, which number of rounds is largest and has an obvious bias, corresponds to a longest distinguisher. In some cases, there are single keybase or relations of keybase in the conditions. Once the bias is detected, the keybase are considered to be the expected conditions and information for a secret keybase can be obtained and this leads to a key recovery attack. There are two steps of this method can be improved. Um, now Wolf gives suggestions on how to manually choose an uh, initial difference rather than providing a specific method for acquiring it. While the initial uh, difference is of crucial importance, it is not easy to manually choose a suitable initial difference. Our improvement, we propose a novel method using MILP to search for an initial difference driving as few conditions as possible as a differential characteristic that covers as many rounds as possible. Biases were detected by experimentally observing certain non-randomness. Our improvement we present a method for evaluating the probability of the difference in the update bit, by which we can detect the bit with an obvious bias. Part 3. With these two improvements, we apply the improved conditional differential cryptanalysis to uh, cut 32. The framework of our analysis is divided into the following four steps. Search for an initial difference and conditions with MILP. The case of bit corresponding to the longest distinguisher, mount key recovery attacks extend the attacks with standard differential attacks. To search for an initial difference and conditions with MILP, we model the difference propagation of the round uh, function. Step 1. Mm, finding all models of difference propagation under the control of conditions. For cotton 32, at each round only two bits are generated by some bits from the previous round. So, the differences in these two uh, bases are caused only by the bases involved in equation 1 and equation 2. There are linear and nonlinear terms in the equations. If there are differences in nonlinear terms, the difference in the update bit can be cancelled by imposing conditions, even if there are differences at the same time in linear terms. If differences appear only in linear terms, there are no possible conditions that could be applied to cancel the differences. They only can be cancelled by one another or they propagate to the next round. For example, for equation 1, if, if this bit LT plus 6 has a difference, the other bits have no differences. We apply one condition, let, let this bit, LT plus 8, be 0, then um, ST plus uh, 13 must have no difference. The number of conditions is 1 and the difference of the update bit is 0. If, if, this, one, if this bit, um, LT plus um, 11 has a difference. The other bits have no differences. No conditions could cancel the difference which appears in the update page and propagate to the next round. In this case, the number of conditions is 0 and the difference of the update page is 1. This shows 
that we can apply conditions to prevent the difference propagation when the difference state is at some particular value. But for some other values, there are no conditions that could prevent the difference propagation. For each exact, exact difference state, it can be confirmed whether conditions could be applied and whether there would be a, a difference in the opted bit according to the previous strategy that aimed at preventing the, preventing the propagation of differences. With respect to equation 1, the difference of st plus uh, 13 depend, de depends, on, de depends on the values and differences of this of these six bits, these six bits. Let's see, denote whether a condition is applied to cancel the uh, difference of the update. <coughs> and let us search all values of the vector, of the vector. Following the following strategies, we give strategies for three situations. The difference state can take on one of 64 uh, values. We drive the exact values of C and the difference of ST plus 13 from each value of the difference state. Then, with re respect to equation 1, we get all 64 values of the 8-dimensional vector presented in table 3. Meanwhile, with respect to equation 2, we can also find all the different state values. It should be noted that in equation 2, there is a constant AT. To simplify uh, constraints of the MILP, we model two cases corresponding to the value of AT. So we get two vector sets presented in table 4 and uh, table 5. Uh, step 2, modeling the vector cells using linear or uh, inequalities. Via stitch bath, we obtain uh, 19 linear inequalities that accurately describe the set of the 64 vectors. After a simple reduction, there are 10 inequalities remaining. L1 shows 13 inequalities. Using the same method, using the same method, we obtain two sets of linear inequalities L2 and L3 that accurately describe the vector sets given in Table 4 and Table 5, respectively. Step 3. Formulating the MILP model to determine an initial difference and minimum, minimum conditions. With, with these linear inequalities, we can, we can obtain the relationships among the differences of bit that generate the update bit, the flag C, and the difference of the update bit in one round. Mm. Then we expand the linear inequalities to n rounds to obtain constraints of the MILP model. N n is a selected number. With this solution, we can obtain both an initial difference and minimum conditions. <coughs> but, but there are too many plain text bits and key bits uh, in the conditions applied in the later rounds, so we prefer apply in the conditions in early rounds rather than all of them. We give um, detecting the bias of the difference. We give three properties. From them, we deduce formula 6 and uh, formula 7 to calculate the probability of difference in the update bit. Thus, using the uh, probability of difference in each bit of the two NLFSRs at the round, where the conditions cease being applied, we can calculate probabilities of update bits in each and every subsequent round. 
algorithm to shows how to calculate the probability probabilities of the differences in the update base from round t to round u. <coughs> we have applied MRLP method to cut uh, 32 for different rounds to obtain different differential characteristics and minimum conditions. Here, we take 77 round cut 32 for example. The minimum number of conditions we get is 34, um, but we only impose uh, 7 conditions from the first 16 rounds, and we recover um, 4 equivalent k bits of the uh, 81 round cut 32 with a bias indifferent of L81. This is the uh, details. This is the initial uh, difference. Uh, these are the seven conditions. Uh, this is the property of the difference of L81. We experimentally verified the, the, the strongly biased difference in bit L81. Using the strongly biased difference in, in in bit L81, we mount K recovery attacks. Uh, the complexity of the uh, experiment is less than 2 of 24 power evaluations of the 62 round cut 32 encryption. The results are listed in Table 7. Combined with the standard differential attack, the conditional differential attack on um, um, 81 round cut 32 can be extended to 97 uh, round, 98 round, 99 round. We can we get the expression of LTST in decryption direct direction. The difference of the difference of of L81 can be expressed by round keys and the uh, cipher text of. Uh, 97 round cut uh, 32 by using equation uh, 17 and equation uh, 18 it, uh, it, 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 uh, relatively. According to this expression, one can calculate uh, dirt L81 by using the cipher text of 97 round cut 32 and uh, 6 equivalent key base. We can recover 10 equivalent k bits of, uh, of, of 90, 97 round cut 32. This is the time complexity. If, if dirt L81 is expected by round uh, keys and cipher text of uh, 80, uh, 98 round cut 32, uh, we can we can recover 11 equivalent kibis. This is the um, time complexity. If the if dirt L81 is, is expected by the cipher text of 99 round cut 32 and round round case, uh, we can uh, recover 13 equivalent kibis, and this is the uh, time time uh, complexity. Uh, part 5 Conclusion MIP can optimize conditional differential cryptanalysis. Conditional differential cryptanalysis can be extended with standard differential analysis. We believe conditional differential ana uh, cryptanalysis with our two improvements can be extended to other NLFF SRs, stream ciphers, and authenticated encryption. Uh, algorithms. This is my references. Thanks for your attention. Good morning, everyone. I'm Bing Wo Lanzhou. 
I come from Hubei University of Technology in China. It's a great honor for me to give a speech at the conference. The title of my report is A Verifiable Combinatorial Auction with Bidder's Privacy Protection. This work is a joint work of Professor Ming Wu Zhang and me. Let's consider the following scenario. In a single auctioneer combinatorial auction, the auctioneer sells multiple goods simultaneously. Bidders bid on any combination of goods that is bundled. The quotation for bundle is called bid. The auctioneer selects the winner and announces the result. The most basic principle is to ensure the fairness of the auction. However, the auctioneer may use loser's bid to maximize the revenue in future auction, and the bidder's private information such as bundle and bid will disclose personal preference and competitive relationship. So, this information are vital and need to be protected while there is a serious competition between bidders. Besides, the auctioneer should not get bidders' identity information from bid, that is, anonymity. When the auction terminates, winners should be able to verify whether the auctioneer gives a wrong payment to maximize the revenue. Finally, the scheme should be scalable as the number of bidders and goods increases rapidly. To solve this problem, we propose a privacy-preserving combinatorial auction scheme in our paper, which can meet the above requirements. Our scheme consists of three phases, system initialization, winner determination, and payment determination. In the system initialization phase, the third-party CSP generates function parameters and a pair of EL gamma case, MPK, MSK. CSP will send function parameters and MPK to bidders which can be used to protect bidder's privacy. Besides, CSP will generate blend signature for bidders, which can be used for verification. In the winner determination phase, all bidders send their bid and bundle to auctioneer. At this moment, Bid and bundle have been processed with MPK and function parameters, so no private information is leaked. The auctioneer will choose winners according to some mechanism. In the payment determination phase, the auctioneer will calculate the payment the winner should pay, and the winner should also be able to verify the correctness of the payment. The auctioneer has M goods G1, G2, GM. We use a vector A to represent the status of goods. If GI has been sold out, AI is 1. Otherwise, AI is 0. Before auction, all AI is 0 because all goods haven't been auctioned. We denote bidder's bid as BI and denote bundle as SI. Take S1 for example. If bidder 1 wants to get product G1, S11 is 1. S12 is 0 means bidder 1 doesn't want product G2. 51 means the average price bidder 1 is willing to pay for each product. B2, S2, Phi2, BN, SN, Phi N, have the same meanings as explained. Below, we will describe the detail of three phases. In the system initialization phase, CSP generates a pair of EL gamma case, MPK, MSK, and sends MPK to bidders. Bidders will encrypt their bundle with MPK later. Besides, 
CSP will generate function parameters and send them to bidders. N is the number of bidders. U is the large number. CSP chooses AI larger than delta to the I. E is the noise. Finally, CSP generates blend signature for phi I and SI. In our scheme, we use blended network ripple scheme, which enables CSP to generate signature without knowing phi I and SI. After that, every bidder computes F phi I. A1, A2, AN, delta, and E are function parameters generated by CSP. Phi I and F phi I is calculated by bidders locally. Every bidder sends F phi I to the auctioneer. Because the function F has been proved to be a one-way function, the auctioneer cannot recover phi I from F phi I, which will protect bidder's bid and bundle. Now, the auctioneer intends to find the winners. When the auctioneer picks out the winner, the main goal is to maximize social welfare, which is the sum of winner's bids. Besides, we assume that one product can only be auctioned to one bidder. That is, if at least one product in the bundle has been auctioned, the bidder will not get remaining goods. During the whole auction, all bundles and bids will not change. In the winner determination phase, the auctioneer needs to pick out the largest fi i. fx has been proved to be a monotonically increasing and one-way function. That is, if phi1 is larger than phi2, f phi1 is also larger than f phi2. So, through comparing the value of f phi i, the auctioneer can find the largest phi i, and the corresponding bidder is bidder i. But the auctioneer cannot determine bidder i is the winner because bidder i's bundle s i may contain goods that have been auctioned. We convert this question to the question of judging whether the scalar product is zero. Let's look at an example here. There are four goods for sale, G1, G2, G3, G4. G1 has been sold out, so the vector A is 1, 0, 0, 0. Peter I wants G2 and G3, so SI is 0, 1, 1, 0. The scalar product of A and SI is 0, which means bidders bundle is available. If bidder I wants G1, G2, G3, then the scalar product of A and SI isn't zero, which means bidder I cannot get his bundle because G1 has been sold out. So, from judging whether the scalar product is zero, the auctioneer can verify whether bidder I bundle contains goods that have been auctioned. In the meantime, bidder I's bundle has to be protected. So, bidder I executes EL gamma encryption algorithm many times to encrypt SI with MPK and sends cipher text CI1, CI2, CIM, CIM plus 1 to the auctioneer. Because the auctioneer doesn't have MSK, so the auctioneer needs CSP's help to compute the scalar product of A and SI. The auctioneer sends A to CSP. CSP will compute and return SKY. SKY is MSK multiplied A, so the auctioneer cannot recover MSK from SKY and cannot directly decrypt cipher text, which will protect bidder's bundle. After decryption, 
All the auctioneer can get is G to the SI multiplier A. At this moment, it is easy for auctioneer to judge whether the scalar product is zero. If the result is 1, that means SI multiplier A is 0, so beta I is the winner of this round, because beta S phi I is the largest and SI is also available. The auctioneer will send the result and beta I will return F phi I, SI, and the signature of SI. F phi I can prove the in the identity of beta i, the signature can guarantee the integrity of SI. The auctioneer will mark beta s bundle as auctioned in vector A and put beta i in the winner set. Then, the auctioneer needs to calculate the payment that beta i should pay. In the payment determination phase, the auctioneer removes bidder I from all bidders and modify A. Then the auctioneer will choose a new winner, bidder J. Bidder J is called the candidate of bidder I because among bidders whose bundle would have been allocated if bidder I were not the winner, bidder J's average value, phi J, is the largest. The auctioneer informs bidder J to send phi J and the signature of phi J. The auctioneer can use the signature to verify the integrity of phi J. After that, the auctioneer can calculate PI, which is bidder S payment. PI is determined by phi J and SI. Finally, the auctioneer sends PI and the signature of phi J to bidder I. The signature can be used to verify whether auctioneer computes a right payment. Bidder I can recover phi J from PI and SI. After verification, if phi J is correct, bidder I will know the payment PI is correct. At this point, the first round of auction is over. Beta I is the winner in the first round. Beta I's payment is PI. The auctioneer will repeat winner determination phase and payment determination phase until find out all winners. We have conducted a simulation experiment on our scheme. The bidder's computation overhead is the time to calculate F phi I and encrypt SI. But we found that the time to calculate F phi I is much smaller than that to encrypt SI. So the former can be ignored. The auctioneer's computation overhead is the time to find the largest phi I and decrypt ciphertext. The main factors that restrict the performance of our scheme are the value of max bid, the number of total bidders and goods. Black line in figure 1, figure 2, figure 3 is the auctioneer's computation overhead. From figure 1, we can see, with the increase of max bid, the auctioneer's computation overhead increases logarithmically. Figure 2 and figure 3 show that, with the increase of total bidders and total goods, the auctioneer's computation overhead grows with a small constant factor linearly. Red line is bidder's computation overhead. Figure 1 and figure 2 show that, the value of max bid and total bidders don't have a big impact because every bidder calculates F phi I and encrypt SI locally. As can be seen from figure 3, with the increase of total goods, bidder's computation overhead grows with a small constant factor linearly as well. This shows that our scheme has good scalability. In our scheme, CSP, the auctioneer and bidders 
don't conspire with each other, which will guarantee the fairness. Beta speed is processed by function f, and the bidder's bundle is encrypted by MPK, which enables the auctioneer to find out winners without revealing bidder's private information. Besides, winners can verify the correctness of payment. In our scheme, bidder's identity information will be protected by an anonymous technique, which keeps the bidder-bid relation private. The bow contents are the main ideas of our scheme. Thanks for your attention. Hey everybody, it's a great pleasure for me to speak here. The topic of my speech today is a multi-user shared searchable encryption scheme supporting circle query. Why do we do it? This is because outsourcing data to cloud servers leads to privacy disclosure. In order to protect user data privacy, plain text is encrypted before outsourcing. However, this will lead to widely used structured queries language of plain text database cannot be directly applied to encrypted database. Therefore, we start the research on searchable encryption supporting circle query. There are two ways to construct a circle query scheme for an encrypted database. The first one is direct, direct operations on encrypted database. It can achieve ideal data confidentiality, but the performance overhead is very large. The second one is encrypted index and quickly locate the records satisfying query conditions by making the encrypted data independent of query operations. So we choose this method and further propose a multi-user shared searchable encryption scheme supporting SQL query. There are four entities in the system model. The user is responsible for collecting classifying data and searching encrypted data through SQL query uh, statements. The PS is responsible for establishing the encrypted index, generating the chapter, sharing the secret key, and describing the search in, uh, results. The DBMS is responsible for uh, storing the encrypted database and uh, executing uh, specific queries. CA is a trusted uh, cer uh, certificate authority that uh, provides trusted uh, credentials for users during key sharing. One of our um, contributors is to propose a new chapter uh, generation method based on the uh, Diffie-Hellman key exchange protocol. Use our uh, since different prox proxy servers generate different chapters and indexes for the same keywords. The query chapter is frequently converted when multi users uh, share data, which leads to vast computation overhead. Uh, using our method can resolve this problem. The other is to design a a double-layered encryption algorithm based on attribute encryption to ensure the secure transmission of symmetric k.
case. This is because in our encryption scheme, we we uh, encrypt the tables in the uh, database with symmetric encryption. So the security of symmetric algorithm depends on the encryption key used. So we need to make it secure. This is our specific scheme. Our multi-user shared searchable encryption scheme consists consists of tuple of to, of eleven algorithm set up is an initialization algorithm. The CA generates global public parameters by it. The second is is the key generation algorithm. The proxy server of the data owner uses uh, system parameters to generate the private uh, key x and the public key x uh, power of g. The proxy uh, server of the data user uh, uses system parameters to generate Priority k y and the public k uh, y power power of uh, g. The third the third is uh, the index index generation algorithm. The proxy server of the, of the data you uh, data owner uh, creates a key a, a keyword index for each. Table ti in the data database. Uh, then for each table ti, the data owner run, runs the uh, force uh, algorithm to uh, gener generate uh, cipher text text and uploads it to the uh, cloud server. In the chapter generation algorithm, the proxy uh, server of the data uh, user follows Diffie-Hellman protocol and uh, calculate this uh, x and x y of x y power of g Us using its private key y and uh, public key x power of g of the which use used as a secret key for generating the chapter without interactions between users. In the sixth uh, algorithm, the proc, proc, uh, proc server of the data owner uses private key x and uh, the public key of user uh, y power of g to compute um, x y power of g. Thus, the data, data owner can control each encrypted table that the user requests. Then the DBMS obtains the search results by running the search algorithm. The remaining uh, four algorithms are designed to in, uh, decrypt uh, search results in order to ensure the, ensure the security of the decryption key. The data, the data owner uses the double-layered encryption algorithm to encrypt the key and send the user. Then we give the proof for the confidentiality of uh, queries and the security of uh, secret keys in uh, section 5. The experimental results show that we achieve a higher level of, of 
um, privacy protection at the cost of uh, slightly um, increasing the computation overhead. In a world, our uh, scheme can provide secure and efficacious in cipher text retrieval on the uh, encrypted database. Our future work consists in impl implementing auto uh, automatic search matches. Thanks for your attention. Hello everyone, I am Zhongyi Liu from Nanjing University of Science and Technology. The title of my talk is Forward Secure Searchable Encryption with Conjective Keyword Search Supporting Multi-User. This is a joint work with Chen Gengxu and Zi Gang Yao. Searchable Symmetric Encryption is a cryptographic primitive. Its meaning consists of three parts of functionality, including encryption, generating search token, and search. Usually, when outsourcing files, data owner generates encrypted data and the encrypted index for these files, and then sends to the server. When data owner wants to query for files containing some special keywords, he generates and sends the search token to the server. Then the server performs the search operation and returns the search result to the user. We recall the two languages of searchable symmetric encryption access pattern and the search pattern. Informally, access pattern is the search result for each given search queries. Search pattern is the information that can be used to detect whether two different search queries are performed for the same keyword or not. In most SSE schemes, access pattern and the search pattern are linked to the cloud server. In dynamic SSE scheme, the access pattern language will be a serious security problem. For example, an old search token is for the keyword W. If a new added file also contains keyword W, this new added file can be matched by the old search token. There are several attack works which can danger the security of DSSE. ITK attack was the first inference attack, which used the language of access pattern. Some improved their world and introduced the file injection attack. Next. We record the file injection attack and know the necessity for the forward privacy. We take a file injection attack as an example. In this system, we set the size of the keyword space is 8. With the access pattern language, the cloud server only needs to inject three files into the encrypted database to get the plain text keyword in every search token. For example, the server injects these three files into the database first not contain the keywords in the white box, such as field 1 contains the keywords W4 to W7. After injecting these files, the cloud server uses an old search token to do the search operation. If none of this injected file is returned, the cloud server can confirm that this old search token is for the keyword W0. If field 3 is returned, this, this search token is for W1. In this way, Cloud Server could recover the plain text of keywords in all old search tokens. So we need a new security definition for DSZ schemes to resist this kind of attack. This new security definition is called uh, forward privacy. For an update query, its language is the operation type, the identifier of the file, and the size of the keyword set. Informally, update operation does not leak any information about the keyword. Directly, forward privacy ensures that new added files cannot be matched by the old search token. There are some schemes ensuring forward privacy, such as ORM-based scheme. They had the access pattern to achieve the forward privacy, but this brings a large bandwidth overhead. Except that updating search token is considered a simple and efficient method. This method does not protect the access pattern, but it enables that New edit files cannot be matched by the old search token. In this paper, data owner use one-way trapdoor permutation to 
to update the search token and use the update search token to generate the encrypted index for the file. To improve this scheme's efficiency, this paper replaces the one-way chapter permutation with the pseudo-random permutation. It achieves a high level of update and search performance. In real scenarios, users usually need to, need to search for files containing multiple keywords in one search query. The conjective keyword FSC scheme allows the query of multiple keywords while ensuring the forward privacy. <coughs> this paper proposes a novel way to support conjective keyword queries, but the cryptographic tool they use is not efficient, and there are some inefficient steps in this scheme. This paper introduced a FSC scheme with conjective keyword search based on OXT scheme. This scheme can support flexible keyword document update, but it performs the inefficient operations many times, and the size of the search token is very large. Both of these schemes cannot support multi-user. In our paper, we propose a FSC scheme that can support conjective keyword search and multiple users. We achieve forward privacy. Our scheme protects the forward privacy. Efficient conjective keyword search. Our scheme supports conjective keyword search and achieves sublinear search efficiency. Multi user. Our scheme supports data sharing among multiple users. This is an existing encryption algorithm we used to support conjective keyword search, named asymmetric scalar product increasing encryption. In order to adopt to our scheme, we give the following equivalent definition. This scheme can be denoted by the following four parts. Set up. This algorithm takes as input the secure parameter lambda and outputs the secret key. Encrypt. This algorithm takes as input the message V, a vector, and the secret key, key A, and outputs the server test, CV. Key generation. This algorithm takes as input the query vector Q and the secret key and outputs the search key, CQ. Decrypt. This algorithm takes as input the server test, CV, and the search key, CQ, and outputs the inner product of the vector V and Q. This is the system model of our scheme. It contains three parts. The PKG is a trusted center. It can start and initialize this system. It is also responsible for generating security key for users who want to join this system. The server is semi-honest. It will perform operations honestly, but will try to learn the information in this operation. All users are trusted center. Users can be both data owner and data user. When a data user wants to search a data owner's file, he can send a request to the data owner. The data owner then sends the necessary information to the data user. This is a formal definition for our scheme. It mainly consists of four parts. Later, we will describe these details. Setup is run by PKG. It takes as input a security parameter lambda and outputs the master key, MS key, and the public parameter PP. Derive is a protocol between the user and the PKG. When an authenticated user UID wants to join this system, the user and the PKG cooperate to generate the user's secret key as key ID. Update is a protocol between the user and the server. The user UID wants to update, aid, or delete a file ND containing keywords WND. He can take it as input ND WND as key ID and OP, and then generates an update token. After receiving the update token, the server stores the token in the map T. Search is a protocol between the user and the server. The user UID wants to search the files containing keywords wsearch. He can take it as input wsearch as KID sigma and then generate a search token. After receiving the token, the server finds the relevant files and returns the results to the user. This algorithm takes as input a security parameter lambda and outputs the master key MS key and the public parameter PP. PKG randomly generates two numbers S and 
A as its master key. Then PKG generates and publishes the public parameter PP. Among them, G1 is an elastic curl growth. G is a generator of G1. N is the size of the predefined keyword space. H1, H2, H3 is the three hash functions. F1, F2, Fp is the three pseudo-random functions. In this protocol, the user wants to join this system. He sends a request to PKG. PKG randomly generates two numbers, X and Y. Then PKG computes K1 and K2, and sends K1, K2 to the user. The user randomly generates a number K3, and keeps K1, K2, K3 as his secret key. When a user wants to update a file containing keywords WT1 to WTL, this protocol first generates the keys KS and KA using user's secret key as KID, where KA is the secret key for ASP scheme. Then we prepare a vector V. After randomly reordering the element position of this vector, we encrypt this vector by the encryption algorithm of ASP. Next, we generate the encrypted keyword file pairs for all the keywords in the file. For every keyword, we randomly generate a new status STC and compute the search index U and the server test E using this new status. The encrypted vector is added to each encrypted keyword file pairs to support a conjecture keyword search. To guarantee forward privacy, we use MC to head the server test vector, where MC is generated by the latest status. Finally, the user sends the search token UEMCV to the server. The server stores the token into the encrypted database T. When a user wants to search the files containing keywords WT1 to WTM, the protocol first uses the local status to determine whether the corresponding file exists on the server. If it exists, it generates the keys KS and KA and prepares a vector queue. After randomly reordering the elements of the vector queue, we encrypt this vector by the key generation algorithm of ASP to generate a search key CQ. Then the user sends the search token TW STC CQ prime to the, to the server. After receiving the search token, the server finds all the updated tokens related to the keyword WT1. And then the server recovers the information EE. If the operation type of the current updated token is 8, the server recovers the encrypted vector CV prime and runs the decrypt algorithm of ASP to get the inner products of the vector V and Q. If this equation is true, the server can determine that the current file contains all the keywords in the search token. Finally, the server returns the search result to the user. We briefly introduce the correctness of our scheme. The point is the server can correctly determine whether the current file contains all keywords in the search token. This is the composition of the vector in the update and the search protocol, respectively. The first n elements represent the keyword size in update token or search token. In the search protocol, the server can get the inner product of the vectors V and Q. If current file contains all the keywords in search token, then the inner product of the first n elements in the vectors V and Q is M. So as TC prime is equal to FP TWSTC. If current file not contains all the keywords in search token, then the inner product of the first n elements in the vectors V and Q is less than M. So STC prime is not equal to FP TWSTC. In our scheme, different users can securely share messages through a public channel. When Alice wants to search Bob's file containing keywords WT1 to WTM, she needs Bob's key, KS, and the status STC. Alice sends a request to Bob. Then Bob computes the, these two messages and sends back to Alice. Next, Alice can compute the key KS. Bob also can compute the key KS by his own secret key. With the key KS, a secure communication channel can be established between Alice and Bob 
Then Bob can securely send the relevant local status STC to Alice. With the key KS and the status STC, Alice generates a search token to search Bob's file on the server. We briefly introduce the security analysis. Because an update token does not leak any information about the keyword, that is, new added file cannot be matched by old state token. So forward privacy is protected. Then shown as follows. There are probabilistic experiments, real world and ideal world. The ideal world simulates the real world through the legacy function L of the algorithms in the scheme. For probabilistic polymer time advisory, if it cannot distinguish the interaction in real world and ideal world, the scheme is adaptive secure. This is the result of comparing the efficiency of our scheme with the FOXTB scheme. In this paper, our scheme consumes additional 11 milliseconds to support multi-users. So when the number of the keywords in the file is small, the efficiency of our update protocol will be slightly slower than FOXTB. Both the time of the update and the search protocol grows slower than this scheme. So our scheme has better update and the search efficiency. Thank you for your listening. Hello everyone, this is Wei Zi, the general chair this year. Thanks for your attention and attendance. Hope you enjoy the presentations. And Copenhagen is a smart and beautiful city, and it's a pity that we cannot meet in person this year. I hope that we can meet in near future. Last, I'd like to thanks again to all the paper authors reviewers and presenters. Hope you can continue supporting SPNC next year. Thanks.